All right, this is Art131 with Wyndham Graves, and I have David and Stephen here to talk about photography. Uh, David, if you'd introduce yourself. Okay, uh, my name is David Campbell. I am the staff photographer at Alabama State University. I've been working there for 20 years um, as a university staff photographer, so it's kind of like a kind of like a mix of commercial and news photography. Um, before that, I worked as a commercial photographer doing product photography. I did a lot of freelance photojournalism for news. Um, I've done wedding photography for a few years some time ago. I haven't done one of those in quite a while. Um, I do a little freelance work every now and then, but not a whole lot because I stay very busy. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. What else you want to know? That'll be fine for now. Stephen? Uh, my name is Stephen Tillman. I'm a uh, graphic designer and product photographer for a local manufacturer in Tallahassee. And I also do real estate photography on the side. I've uh, been doing that job, uh, doing the product photography job for about the past four years. And real estate for a little bit longer than that. Um, and yeah, that's about it. All right, great. Well, I, uh, Sorry, go. I'm sorry, I was... Yeah, the product photography job. That's uh, so you do like a lot. You like for is it like a wholesale company or what, what kind of product? Yeah, you Stephen, you 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 can you can yeah. say who you work for. <clears throat> yeah, uh, I work for VZ Grips. Uh, we manufacture gun grips, so I get to take oh. a lot of. Um, mostly, cool. it's you know pictures of grips on guns. Uh, occasionally, try to do lifestyle type pictures. Um, people using it's the product. Kind of fun. Uh, it's cool. it's difficult to do the lifestyle stuff though because anyone using our product is covering it with their hands <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's a problem well, well you could always like show it in holsters and stuff i guess you know yeah know. yeah we, we find yeah. creative workarounds yeah, yeah some i of just got a, is really brave. i just got a sound trigger so i've been wanting to like try to get muzzle flash pictures <laughs> Ooh. i have an uh and i want to do the thing like the bullet going through the apple oh yeah that's yeah. a rough thing to try to get yeah those those are kind of those are that's definitely a very technical kind of thing yeah, well, that's what the sound trigger's for, though. It should work pretty good. I just haven't had time to mess with it. I live out in the country, so I can do this in the backyard. <laughs> oh, but, oh, that's uh, good. Yeah, I yeah, worked no. for, uh, I guess about three years, I worked for a company called CCC Associates, and they uh, they had all these factories over in China, and they made, like, artificial Christmas trees and porcelain and pottery and mm. home decoration and all kinds, of, all kinds of stuff. And I was, so I had to shoot for catalogs, and it, we would make these catalogs that went to wholesale companies and they sold like millions of dollars worth of stuff. But, but I was alone in a studio all day with these ladies would bring me giant carts full of stuff in the morning and then leave. That's a really <laughs> yeah. bizarre. Doing like a lot of a, uh, like just white box type photography. Um, yeah, there was, I had a, I had a table where I would set products up on it and I would get these little, these little metal things that I would put the stock numbers from the products on to put in the shot because this is, we didn't have Photoshop. Uh, this was prior. This was uh, oh, this all, is a every, analog analog days. Yes, everything was on film, and I had a I would I had a little mini lab where I processed and printed eight by tens, and then we'd stuff those eight by tens into notebooks to send out to all the sales people. Um, and sometimes we would do. About every two weeks, we would have a, a shoot where we would... I had this real big studio. We would set up, like, room scenes. Like, we'd bring a table in, and they would bring a stylist in, and we'd have, like, a, a meal set up on the table if we were doing dishes. And then we would uh, photograph the dishes and photograph the table, and then they would change everything out, and we'd do it again, change everything out, and we'd do it again to show all the different finishes. Um, Christmas trees. God, Christmas trees were terrible because they had, like, 50 different artificial trees, and I had to... Sit there and, and fluff got... every little oh, tentacle. Yeah. Oh man, <laughs> that'd be a rough gig. Yeah, yeah and then and then the ornaments, the, the little the little glass balls you buy, like to hang in your Christmas tree. I would, I would have like a setup where we took a couple of limbs off a tree, and then it would hang down in there, and it was all lit. And you would get all the stuff set up, and then you know, it had to be real good, clean, and sharp. So I would set everything up, and then the air conditioner would turn on, and it would just start to rotate. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, at the time I was doing a lot of um, I was doing a lot of freelance work for news newspapers and I was I was pulling just about as many hours with the local paper here then as I was at my job and uh, 
I was just so much more in love with the idea of going around and taking pictures of people and covering stories and going to college football games and stuff like that. It was just more of a uh, getting out and actually doing stuff rather than yeah sitting in the studio all day. Yeah, no, I, I yeah, feel yeah. You. yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would say it was probably yeah. Yeah. Seventy percent of my job is sitting at a computer and either working on our website or photoshopping something, and then yeah, the other thirty percent is actually taking photos. Yeah, well, it's evolved. Um, mine has uh, evolved that way over the years quite a bit as well. You know, it's, uh, like I went into work today just to upload photos for people to do things with that I had already taken. Of the uh, the quarantine we're dealing with being in higher education like when Wyndham can tell you the same you know we've sent all our students home there's no more sports there's no more events and I'm an event driven person so that's been kind of weird and the past uh, few weeks I've been scanning film that I shot 20 years ago to do throwback posts on social media so that's you know that's kind of weird too oh that's good gives you something to do in the the quarantine I bet you're finding some interesting stuff as well Oh, I found uh, the most interesting story. Yeah, I yeah. Uh, I pulled this our spring A Day game year two thousand. I was going through my negatives and scanning them, and I, I I carry a reporter's pad, you know, where I have to write captions so I can get people's names and so on and so forth. So I'm going through there, and I find the caption. I, I wrote down uh, "girl in uh, dress, five year old Sydney Foster," and I was like, wait a minute. So I found this picture, and apparently it was never used because it wasn't sharp. But Sidney Foster grew up, um, joined the military, and then went to college. And when she was in college, she was my student worker. Oh, and that's now crazy. she's a staff photographer for the governor of Alabama. And she's huh. done all these all these internships with fashion studios up in New York. And she's she was um she was the one that did all the portraits for our new mayor here. I mean, she's really doing well with photography. And, oh, I uh, think the I fact that I met her. Yeah, I'm sure you've yeah. met her. Yeah, I'm sure you have. Um, she, uh, it, it, it was just amazing to see that I had photographed her picking up an Easter egg when she was a little kid. That's hilarious. That's and, so and, and I had no recollection of it. I just saw that in my notes. I was like, oh, it can't be. And I sent it to her, and she wrote me back, where the hell did you get that picture? <laughs> <laughs> Serendipitous. That's awesome. Yeah, um, that was a neat experience. So before we really just tangent off into nothingness, um, yeah, you're gonna have to edit me yeah, out. Yeah, I'm no, sorry. That's fine. No, that's good. Uh, I think it's I think it is important for people who just kind of take photography as this granted as this like for granted thing that happens on their phone sometimes to know that like there are people who devote their lives to making it really really good. Um, but that's what I wanted to get you uh, both of you on is why photography as a medium why did you guys pick that thing or did it kind of pick you uh steven you want to go first um i feel like it kind of picked me um i couldn't really tell you why i do it um other than it's something i've had an interest in since i was you know a young teenager um i remember um my dad signed us up for Earthlink Internet back in the days of dial-up, and the promotion they were having was, you get a free digital camera. And this is back when digital cameras were kind of a new thing still, and it was the worst camera you could possibly imagine. Um, <laughs> yeah, 640 by 480 images, and I think you got, you know, it would only take like 15 of them before the memory was full. Mm-hmm. And you, you had to download them with a through a serial cable. Oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and from there, I was like, "Wow, I, this is fun! I want something better." And I convinced my parents to buy me a little Sony CyberShot, and had a lot of fun with that. And then when I finally got to uh, college. Um, you know, I was taking, I took uh, traditional analog photography and then digital photography, which is where you, Wyndham, convinced me to buy an SLR. Yeah, I remember that. And just kind of kept developing the hobby from there. And now, now what do you shoot with? Uh, right now I shoot with a Sony a7 III most of the time. Uh, sometimes for work I still use a, an Olympus EM1. Mm-hmm. Um, do you shoot any film anymore? 
Um, rarely. Um, I've gotten to the point where if I'm going to shoot film, it's only worth it to me if I'm going to shoot medium format. Okay. And what's the and size I, of medium for? What, what's the size of medium format? Uh, basically, anything larger than a 35 millimeter negative is considered medium format. But what or, size um, is the one or, that you shoot? It's um, it, the, it, nowadays it's all 120 film, which is yeah. 65. Yeah, 65 millimeters in diameter, or okay. not in diameter in in width. Mm -hmm. It's a roll film, but different cameras will produce different size images on it. So they use yeah, a different so, length of the film. Yeah, it depends yeah, like, on how how much of the film you want to use, how wide a yeah. section of the roll the, you want to use. The, the camera, I've got a, um, uh, exactly. a six by six um, Yashica medium format that I shoot on sometimes. Um, so that would I, take I, a I square have, image on that piece of film. Yeah, it, it's a square okay. image, but you can have. There's some cameras that shoot a little bit smaller, some that shoot up to six by nine centimeters. Pardon? I said I'm restarting. Um, <laughs> David, uh, give us your start, kind of why why did photography choose you or why did you choose photography and how and how'd you get your start? Um gosh. I don't know. No, it's it's I know, but it's I'm trying to think of a, a really concise way to answer this question. Um when I was a kid I was like I was a sort of a science geek, right? Mm -hmm. Like I loved Carl Sagan and all those little well, you know, I'm I'm older than you. When I was a kid, we we would get all these little kits like to build radios and stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, and I can remember once one year my parents got me this optical science kit, and it was this little plastic thing, and you could build a 35 millimeter camera. And I was just fascinated with the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And then as I got a little older, I was racing BMX bikes and riding skateboards and stuff like that. And these these magazines always had these action shots in them, so. Yeah, that's kind of like the thing I really got into was taking pictures of my friends doing all this stuff. And then I got to college, and um, I really, when I first got to college, I wanted to be, I, I was really interested in physics and astronomy. Like, I was a big Carl Sagan fan when I was a kid and all that. And uh, math turned out to be really hard. I just hated <laughs> math. And then my, my first class was photography. And, um, you know, we had to have the we got a thing from the teacher we had to have all these supplies on day one and our first day he sat down he says you know you, you get a notepad book you put a roll of film in your camera and you go out and you you do you take all these pictures to learn about depth of field and all this different stuff and day two we went down to the dark room and developed film and day three we made contact sheets and and from there on but i just was amazed with the whole thing uh i can remember uh you know printing photos in a dark room and watching the pictures come up on paper and just be like, holy shit, you know, this is just like the coolest thing I'd ever seen. And, um, and, and math was really hard. So, you know, sometimes I joke and I say photography is what I, be, or I say that's math. I say math is why I became a photographer instead of a rocket scientist. And, um, <laughs> and it's just ever since then, that's, it's really, um, well, you know, probably within a year, of taking that class i got a job at a camera store so i was going to school still taking photography classes and working at the camera store and then i went to work at a pro, pro photo lab where i processed film and made prints for pro photographers so then i got exposed to a lot of guys that were doing weddings and portraits and all different kinds of stuff and i started picking up little side jobs and learning from them and that's just kind of mushroomed from there and when the when the photo lab went out of business as the digital days were coming it really kind of a lot of things were kind of changing in the industry at the time and the, the lab really went out of business before the digital days came in because other labs were running it out mm -hmm. um internet was come was not really invented it was kind of coming around but uh and another lab here in town was kind of growing and we were kind of shrinking and then i got the i got the job doing the product photography and from there i got the job at asu and here i am all right and, and um, i still i'm still fascinated with it it's still um you know i i work you know i have my regular job and you know when you know when we don't have quarantines for viruses you know i tend to work 60 hour work weeks and you know, I'm all I'm event driven. I'm at football games, basketball games, and then I'm still back in there at eight in the morning and all this. But it's still my hobby. When I'm not at work, I'm always taking pictures of stuff. 
Yeah, so and, and if I'm somebody still... sees a, a guy with a big camera on, a, on an ASU sideline, 50-50, it's you, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, or, you know, if it's not the other media, it's 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 me. I've been doing it there for a while, but it's, yeah. uh, it's cool. And I'm um, still, I mean, it's, and I think, you know, I think if I, if anyone asks, like, you know, what, what it takes to be into photography, you have to have a passion for it. You have to be fascinated yes. with it. If you're not, if you're not fascinated with it, you'll never, you'll never do it because almost, almost every job there is or any type line of work in photography, you're, you're working crazy hours and, mm-hmm. you know, to be honest with you, it's not always the best paying and I mean, you know, rocket scientists make a lot more money, but hey. <laughs> but it takes math. Yeah. Uh, well, that, yeah. That kinda... You know, well, photography takes me, math but... too. I mean, it really does. But well, and David, before yeah. we continue, um, what are you shooting with nowadays? Um, Both professionally and for fun. Uh, professionally, a uh, Nikon D5 and a Nikon Z6, which are both one is a mirrorless digital and the other is an SLR. Um, I'm not a huge gearhead. I mean, you know, I don't think it really makes him. I mean, to, to me, a camera is like a tool. It's like when you talk about Nikon or Canon, it's like a red, a, ha- a red handled hammer or a blue handled hammer. You still pound <laughs> nails. I mean, they all work the same way. I'm not, you know, I'm not crazy. Like my hobby stuff, as, as you know, I do. I shoot with film, um, mm-hmm. and I have some digital cameras too. But I, I, I have a dark room. I have. A, I live out in the country. I have a barn, and there's a dark room out there, and and I just really enjoy the whole, the whole uh, what as Stephen call it, the analog process um yeah. it's fun um nowadays there's all these these guys are like selling all this weird film that's like movie film that's like iso 12 and stuff and and there's just there's all these different things you know i've got a i've got a camera that you that wyndham 3d printed for me that's a, a mm-hmm. medium format camera that's a six by 12 and i've got a large format lens on it which the lens is jammed but that's another story <laughs> um i've got a i've got a four by five i've got a four by five view camera which i enjoy using because it, it's it's manual and i have control over perspective and and you know i can shoot at f64 i can shoot at f45 and have fairly shallow depth of field it's, it's just it's just fun I'm sorry if I'm talking too much. Oh no, no, it's totally fine. Mm. Um, and and you don't shoot anything large. large you don't shoot anything full. F- um, sorry, you don't shoot anything large format, do you? Yeah. Well, oh, yeah. Okay. F- four by five is considered. Yeah. Oh, I think of when I think of large format, format I think of eight by tens. But I guess that's gigantic. no anything. Anything bigger than one twenty was generally large format. Um, okay. Yeah, four by five is large format. Um, I don't have an eight by ten camera. It's something I want to get eventually. I have mm-hmm. a friend that you need. You, I have a friend that you need to meet. Yeah, that no, does we wet, need to go. He does wet plate, and he's uh yeah, he's got this big. It's like a ten by twelve or something, and he's got nineteenth century lenses, and he coats the glass with these chemicals, and it's just a fascinating thing. To is that watch. the silver colloidian process or silver colloidin, whatever? Yeah, it is yeah, yeah, it's okay. like a, yeah, cl- right, yeah, cool. yeah. It, it is That's exactly what he's doing. Um, he uh, he and a buddy of his they shot a photo that's on a uh, with that camera that's on the uh a lucero album mm-hmm. if you know the band lucero anyway <laughs> but uh pretty pretty neat stuff but in, anyway i'm sorry I'm, I'm just babbling on oh no go for it uh, you're yeah. gonna have to edit me this is the um, neat stuff uh, i haven't yeah. said fuck yet though <laughs> <laughs> except for right there <laughs> um, Oops. go ahead and make a timestamp so, so you can edit so when we're i don't bother uh it doesn't matter um so when you guys are so i think this is a big thing is that both of you and i have a huge amount of equip of of equip of equipment whether it be different camera bodies different camera lenses different types of film different accessories all this other junk that we have in our lives um when you go out to shoot how do you pick what you're going to take that day um, and if you want to use a few different examples, like two or three different examples of stuff you shoot and like your kit for that day, uh, that's fine. Um, Stephen, would you like to go first? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it totally depends on what I plan to shoot. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I'm going to do a real estate job, I have essentially one lens that I use. And what is that? Uh, it's a 16 to 35 millimeter. And what would uh, that look like for most people? Um, on a full frame camera, that's pretty wide uh, it's not as wide as you can get but close to it 
And that's just to help make smaller spaces look larger when I'm shooting real estate. And being able to zoom in from 16 to 35, I can also get a little bit tighter exterior shots where I can back up away from a home mm -hmm. and not make it look like a fun house. That helps. That always helps. Um, uh, and give if, us, what, what about it when you go into astrophotography? Because you do some of that nighttime stuff. Um, for astrophotography, uh, again, it's just one lens. Um, and it's basically the same kind of lens. It's a, um, a 14 millimeter prime lens, uh, meaning it doesn't zoom. Uh, and it's an f2.8, so it's fairly bright. Um, and that's just to make shooting the stars that are fairly dark easier. Mm -hmm. um, but now if I'm going to shoot wildlife, uh, I've got a 150 to 600 millimeter lens, mm -hmm. you know, so I can get small things that are far away and, you know, fill the frame with them or stay yep. as far away as I need to from alligators. Yes. That's definitely um, important. <laughs> now I always struggle if I'm going into a situation where I'm not sure what I'm going to be shooting. I tend to overload and just bring every lens I think I might want and, you know, I end up with, you know, a whole suitcase full of equipment that I, you know, don't use most of. Yeah. And David, I want to shoot alligators. David, how about you? <laughs> come, come, come down here to Florida. We got plenty of them. Oh, yeah. 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 I've, uh, I've, uh, I've gone. There's a place I've been, like, I've been there three times now. It's uh, in, in North it's north of you, northeast of you, and it's called a cheesy pond. And it's a, it's a paddle trail, and they have all these big bald cypress trees, and there's, there's marks on the trees to guide you through it. And I've paddled up on them, and you know, like it, the moment I've been able to actually get a sight of them, they completely freak out and splash water all over the place and, and submerge, and then that's you yeah. don't see them again. Yeah, alligators so, yeah. are very skittish. They're you can't get too close to them they'll just they'll run away yeah um, they're yeah. not into it they're not interested and in I, the fight i actually i re or maybe a few years ago i bought a kayak thinking okay i'm going to use this to get to places i wouldn't normally be able to get to and take photos i wouldn't otherwise be able to get and i've yet to work up the courage to actually put expensive equipment on the kayak and trust that i'm not gonna, gonna <laughs> oh, just drown it and Drown it and lose it in a river. Oh, somewhere. Well, dry bag it. You gotta, you gotta have a dry bag. Or a, it, yeah. If you don't, if you don't have a Pelican case, um, if you guys have Harbor Freight tools down there, yeah, they do. They have these, yeah, we do. these. They have these knockoffs of Pelican cases that are like really nice, and they're like, a, I mean, it's like a decent one to carry a small camera kit. It's like thirty-five bucks. Yeah, I've actually, I've got one, uh, one or two of them. Uh, I actually, I use one of them to carry my drone in. Um, not necessarily because I need to. The the drone bag that came with it was fine, but just to look more professional when I'm on a job site. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, and David, when yeah. you're going out to shoot stuff, um, give me a few examples of what you would take. Like one, maybe one professional and one or two of your personal fun time shoots. Jeez. Um. Well, like my daily at work, like you know, my my typical daily thing i carry a bag and i've got a camera body uh 70 to 200 uh 24 to 70 and a 14 to 24 in all zoom lenses so the 70 to 200 um, is what most people would think of when they think of like um when a wedding photographer is taking like those longer range portraits it's oftentimes yeah. on that 70 to 200 okay yeah that's probably, that's one of the more common lenses used and then, um what were the other two uh uh 24 to 70 Okay. And a 14 to 24, which is a, a real wide lens. Um, okay. I don't so, always carry the 14 to 24. It's kind of big and it's heavy. Um, I've got a, a cheaper, I've got a, a six, it's like a 16 to, it means a, I don't know, what is it, like a 16 to 35 maybe? Those Something are like standard, that. Yeah. But it's an F4, mm -hmm. um, which is fine with the newer cameras. Since the newer cameras have come out, the F4 is fine. The, the others are all F2.8s. Um, that's my like typical, and you know, and I'll always carry a flash, even though I, I don't always use it. I very rarely use it, um, but I pretty much always keep one in the bag in case I do need it. Mm -hmm. 
And then let's see. That's like a, just a typical daily setup. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I do a lot of sports, so I've got a 400 millimeter lens I'll carry if I'm doing stuff like that, except uh-huh. for basketball. I'll use the 70 to 200 for that. Um, and then personal stuff. You know, that's just that just just depends on what I'm doing. That's I've got a whole bunch of cameras. You know, my wife was cleaning up in the house, and she said, "You got more crap than I've ever seen <laughs> yesterday." <laughs> yes, I do. I've got stuff everywhere. I guess um, I've got a. Uh, it, it just sort of, you know, it depends on my mood. It's for for my fun, for my personal stuff. It's my hobby, so it's like you know, sometimes uh, I've got a Leica thirty-five millimeter camera, and I've got mm-hmm. I've got three lenses for that that I use. Um, I enjoy working with it a lot because it's small and light. It's a cool little camera. The lenses are very sharp. I've got a um, I have a Russian-made swing lens camera, which if you're familiar with the Japanese camera, the Wide Lux, it's a mm-hmm. camera where the lens swings from one side to the other. Yeah, to do a panoramic film. exposure, right? Yeah, it's a panoramic camera. The film's in the sits on a curved plane. Yeah, and mm-hmm. um, so it's a 28 millimeter lens. So you don't have a lot of circular distortion, but it sees uh, 175, I guess, degrees from side to side. So it's like the and iPhone it's... Uh, panorama mode where you swing the phone around, except you're actually swinging the lens around onto a flat piece of film or on a curved Correct. piece of film. Yeah, Correct. That, that's a really cool um, camera. Yeah. Uh, here, like the past few years, the actor Jeff Bridges has kind of made that thing popular Um He's put out some books. He's been working with them for years. He's got oh really? That's books cool. where uh, yeah, a lot of even like uh, a lot of the movies he's been in, he carries the camera on the set. Huh. So um, okay, he's got that's it, um, he's got pictures like in the Big Lebowski. He's got pictures where they were filming on set, and then when after they would they would cut, he'd the, get a shot or take two. That he he would pull it out and he would shoot pictures of the set. So he has like the lights and the cameramen and the other actors and actors. Oh, that's awesome. Um, he was on uh, he was on Jimmy Kimmel there not too long ago, a month or so ago, and it, it kind of went around Facebook. I think I shared it on Facebook where he was talking about his work with it, and I think the price on those things went up on eBay like two or three years ago when his book started coming out. But yeah. uh, but I've got um, mine is yeah, a I mean, Soviet. I remember looking Russian at one. The, you're talking about the Hasselblad, the X Pan. No, that's a flat plane camera. Um, okay. That's a panoramic camera, but the uh, the the X Pan has a it's a very has a, it has a wide lens, but it, it creates the, it creates the same size negative, but the film is on a flat plane, so it's like a really wide angle camera. Um, a swing lens is a different sort of beast. The film sits on a curved, the film goes around a curved drum on the inside, and then the lens mo- actually physically moves. Um, wide Lux was a Japanese company that made them that was real popular there's a i believe it's a swiss company called noblex um noblex has made them too the noblexes are real expensive and they have medium format versions that's crazy um, the one i have is a horizon which the horizons actually came out i think the horizons may have actually preceded the wide lux they were made in moscow back in the 50s and then uh they they were these little flat things and then they had a big steel one and then in the late 80s, mid-late 80s, they came out with a plastic one that was fairly good price. And I got one probably right around 1989, 90, something like that. And I wore it out, and I just recently replaced it. That's cool. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's, and it's to me, I think, honestly, I think it's every bit as good as a Wide Lux. But it's, you know, you can get one out of Russia for like 125 bucks, you know, 50 bucks oh, for shipping. Fun. Yeah, it's a really interesting but, uh, thing for those people who aren't really deeply into this hobby. Um, how much old, weird lenses come out of the old Soviet Union areas? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. A lot if, of good you, if you want to do, that. if you want to do analog stuff for cheap, look and look at Russian made stuff. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. If you if you can't afford a, a Hasselblad five hundred, look at a Kiev eighty eight. Yep. Yeah, I I had a Kiev eighty eight. Um, a long time ago, I kept it for about two or three months and sold it because, to, to be honest with you, I think the it was just the lenses were terrible. Yeah, yeah. my um, uh, my uh, eleven by eleven camera um, shoots with a Russian large format lens. It's great. Yeah. Now the the Kiev thirty five millimeters 
were actually pretty decent. Um, at the end of World War II, you know, when they split Germany, mm. the contacts factory uh, was in Jena. Mm. So that wound up on the east side. And the Soviets, they, they pretty much loaded up the factory along with some of the optical scientists and workers and moved it to Kiev yep. and started a new factory where they continued to make the exact same camera. Um, now, they made, they made copies of Leica cameras in Moscow, but those were actually copies. The ones that they made in Kiev were at were really kind of the, still the same design. Yeah. Yeah, they were the same Which, pieces of equipment yeah. and same grinders and everything. And, and Nikon got their start out by copying that same contacts camera, too. The first Nikons were copies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the first every Canons once were in copies a while, of the Leica. Every once in a while, you can find a Nikon lens on eBay that's a contacts mount. Yeah, they're a little different. The, 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 the flame distance is a little different yes. on the, the Nikon and the contacts, but the yeah. contacts and the Kiev are the same. Yeah. But yeah. Um, enough so, old history. Nobody's interested in that. No, we all love old history. Except that's, for us. That's the fun part. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, now, uh, you both shoot a little bit of film, which I don't. Um, what keeps you going back to film? David, why don't you kick us off? Hmm. Well, for many years, you know, I was single and I had a dark room in my apartment and I always just enjoyed it. And... So is it just Gosh, that Zen thing? That's a, that's a, I don't know. I don't even know where to start. Um, I'm not <laughs> really sure. Um, because I remember when digital cameras first came out, I was real fascinated with that. And I still am. I mean, it's, you know, you know, like we had an event at, at ASU this past year where you know these students that was like the freshman talent show or something and i i took a picture of these girls up in the stands that were holding their phones in their hands and they're, they're lit with the light from the phone and i'm like you know 60 yards away and, and i'm shooting this thing at like eighty thousand iso or something yeah. <laughs> a decent image and that's like a mind-boggling thing to anyone who's been around for a while but um i don't know you know i uh I've always had all my old cameras, and a few years ago, I guess one story I tell, a few years ago, I got my camera out, and uh, I had this big Great Dane, and mm -hmm. um, he was a big, big, a big male Great Dane, it's like the biggest dog I've still ever seen. This is the one and, that's um, like bigger than the donkey you guys have, right? He was taller than our donkey, yeah, we have a miniature donkey, and Edgar was taller than him. <laughs> Boy. So I, I, I took him outside. He was a really cool dog. He's a real friendly, fun dog. And I took him outside and I made him sit down. My wife will never, will never pose for pictures. When every time I get like a new piece of equipment or something, I have to test it out. So Edgar was always my model. <laughs> uh, my dog that I have now, she's actually sitting here looking at me. Um, she, she doesn't sit still. Mm. But Edgar would sit still and Edgar would make faces. So I took him outside and I, I, I set him down and I took his picture. I took like two or three pictures. And then I lowered the camera down in front of myself, and my left thumb came up into the air and went bump, 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 like I was trying to push a play button. And I said, what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> I said, holy shit. And, uh, and I started thinking about that and, um, <laughs> and how, how it evolved to the point where, you know, you're just always chimping yeah. with the digital cameras. And um, Explain what chimping is. Ch oh, okay, yeah, yeah, that's a funny thing. Yeah, nobody knows that. Okay. Uh, when you, when you look at the pictures on the back of your camera after you shoot them to see whether or not you got the shot, that's called chimping. Yeah, but why is was, it called chimping? That was started. It was started. Okay, <laughs> when digital cameras first came out, I mean, when they, this is like year two thousand, <laughs> there was a website, and if you remember before social media, we had forums, on the web forum sites, mm -hmm. and there was one called sportshooter dot com, and it's I think it's still around. I I used to have a page on there. I have. Gosh, I might still. I haven't looked at it in years. But um, these guys made this video. And the thing is, because nobody, this is like, you're dealing with people that have shot film all their lives and these digital cameras come out. And, you know, when, when you shoot sports, especially, because there's all this fast action and all this stuff going on, and you'd shoot film and you, you wouldn't know whether or not you, a big play would go down. You might think you have the shot, but you don't know. Mm -hmm. And it, it, sports photography is not a guaranteed thing. It's It's very... One of the reasons I enjoy, you know, I hate, I, I never sit and watch sports. I, I, I don't enjoy that at all. I'm not like a sports fan guy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't have any like 
go team shirts or you know I, you know i don't even sit and watch you know the super bowl's on i care more about the commercials you know yeah. it, it, stuff like that but uh but i love being on the sidelines shooting it's like one of my favorite things to do but uh you know because there's there's just so much so much going on you have to pay attention you you have to uh so but but anyway so these guys made this video because when it when this first happened like when people realized they could push this little button see like right after and all of a sudden you, if you get a good shot people would look at it and they go ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh and they made this video of people going ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then and then it was kind of like um it was kind of like a play on something else where they'd say and say it's okay everybody does it and they'd go around and they'd say see he does it too yeah. and they'd like show him looking at the camera and um so they made that little video and that kind of that kind of coined the term chimping and um that's that's actually where it came from yep but, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, see, no, I, I had heard the term chimping before, but I didn't. I did not understand its origin until just now. Really? I bet if you, you yeah. know what, I bet, Steven, I bet if, I, if we were in a class, we were told that story. You were not paying attention that day. I must not have been. Yeah. <laughs> well, both you guys, if you guys are, if you guys are the same age, you're you're a lot younger than me, so you probably. When did you? When were you guys in college? We would have been doing photography stuff maybe 2005, 2006. Yeah, I, okay, yeah. I, so, so, yeah, okay, so yeah, you guys were in college like yeah. after that really went down. So gosh, Yeah, so it was already cool. an ingrained term by that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, All right, yeah, David, yeah, I wonder if... Uh, David, why do you like shooting film? Why do I like shooting film? It's, well, gosh, well, I got off. You know what? I got, we, whoa, we really went off on a tangent there, didn't we? Um. <laughs> So anyway, I took that picture of my dog that day, and I, I like found myself trying to chim. And I thought about it for a while, so I just started shooting more. Like when my wife and I would go places, family stuff, I just started shooting film more. Mm-hmm. And um, I, 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 there's several reasons. Um, one, I found that doing that on my side, working with cameras that are all manual, mm-hmm. makes me sharper. Ah. Um, I realized not about a few months after that happened, I realized that uh, the president of our university called me and asked me to come to the president's office to take a photograph of a check presentation or some, some military guys were there or something. I don't know what there were some dignitary people there. So I went down there, I took all these pictures of them and I left and I was walking back to my office and I said, shit, you know what? I never looked to make sure that I didn't screw that up. And I, and I realized, you know, I had not once since from the time I left the office to the time I was almost back to the office actually used that play button. And I flipped through everything. I was like, well, yeah, it all looks good. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, I th- and I think the thing is when you – back in the day, you know, we didn't have that option. Mm-hmm. So we couldn't use it as a crutch. So you thought about things before you did them. Mm-hmm. So I think it kind of – I think I had gotten lazy and, and, and I, it, in, in my way of doing things. And I think it's it's kind of like um, you know, like football players lift weights to be stronger. Well, maybe I shoot film to be mentally stronger or sharper. That's a good way to look at so it. That, that's part of it. That's part of it. Plus, there's this thing like you go and you take pictures for a while, and then you come home, and you throw the roll of film in a drawer, and um, you, you you wait a week or so, and then you develop it, and, and you know, and you don't know whether or not. You don't know what's there until you take it out and you pull it off that little metal reel and you hold it up to the light. And it's like, cool. You know, and it's just, there's this immense, like, fascinating thing with that. Uh huh. So, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it's It's the fascination. Um, cool. There's a certain romance, maybe, is a good word to it. I don't mm-hmm. know. You know, there's this, this thing like that. Um, yeah, it's like the um, almost the magic, the where science gets somewhat magic flavored. Yeah, yeah. And the as uh, as far as like, yeah, you know, I don't really take shoot a lot of color film. I, I usually use my digital cameras for any kind of color pictures. Mm-hmm. But when I'm really wanting black and white pictures, and I do a lot, I, I do like look. Mm-hmm. There is there's a look that I can I can I can process digital images into black and white. And um, I'm probably pretty good at it, having worked with film and understanding how color contrast filters and all that stuff works. Mm-hmm. But uh, it, there tends to be, uh, I don't know, maybe if too much perfection is the right way to put it. There, there tends to be a, um, 
working with the working with the old tools, there, it tends to have. There's just a look that you get. It's just not the same. It has song. Um, yeah. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> See, I only needed one one word. Yep. Um, and Stephen, why do you shoot yeah. film? Um. Well, you know, like Dave was saying, I grew up in the post digital age of photography. Um, you know. I remember my dad shooting film pictures of me and um, maybe using a cheap uh, instant camera, but um, it wasn't until I got to school and took a um, traditional photography class that I really got interested in film. Mm -hmm. And there's just something deeply satisfying about taking the image developing the film and then making a print and the whole process being completely physical you never touch a computer you know and getting that thing in your hands at the end that you made mm -hmm. just very satisfying and I think part of the reason I don't do it as much anymore is because I don't have access to a dark room um, oh yeah well, now, to... now you got the space, man. Well, I, yourself a yeah, now, yeah, now I've got a new house with two bathrooms. I might uh, block out one of the, the window and see what I can do. <laughs> uh, see, this is the problem, everybody, is that you get into this and then one of your bathrooms becomes a dark room. Yep. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah, David, but, you've um, kicked yourself out to a barn, right, for your dark room? Yeah, yeah, um... <laughs> Yeah, you know, I uh, it, when I had an apartment, I had it in a in a closet for a while. And then, yeah, I used to set them up in the bathroom. And um, yeah, even when I worked in a photo lab, <clears throat> I used to set one up in my bathroom. Um, I mean, when I had all the state of the art equipment at work, I would go home and I'd have this crappy little Bessler and larger, and I'd I'd put it on the tub and put the trays down in the bottom and, and sit there and drink and print until like two <laughs> in the morning. And uh, and I just loved it. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, one of the things I've gotten into more recently is uh, instant film. Oh yeah, yeah that's something yeah. we should cover. Yeah, um, I've got a um, an instant flex seventy, uh, which is basically a copy of a like a Rolleiflex. It's a twin lens reflex camera. Oh, I saw that it on the internet. Yeah, and it shoots uh, Fuji film, Instax, Mini film. And yeah, I've seen those on the internet. That's really kind of neat. The the you know the lens is not great. It's st still I think only an f three five, um, and you know the the format itself is not the sharpest, crisp, you know, clean image you're gonna get. Yeah. There's still something really cool about taking a picture and then a few minutes later you've got something physical in your hand. Just it's light and mm, tenable. Yeah. That's, that's something that's been hard for me to get back into. Um, I've tried the Impossible Project films, and I guess they bought the Polaroid name, so now it's back under the Polaroid name. Right. But uh, And I understand they're better now, so I've been planning on ordering some. Um, but uh, yeah, I've got, a, I've got a, a Polaroid SX-70. Uh, and the, the, the original Polaroid SX, SX-70 film was different. Um, there was this big... Uh, art world trend back in like the 80s and 90s where you you'd get that SX70 and people would carry all these little burnishing tools and the print would come out and then just as it starts to develop you'd start rubbing on it and manipulating it and it comes out looking people that were really good it would actually look almost like a like a cartoon huh. like a watercolor you could really image. burnish it right in the chemical process in the instant film yes yes you'd rub on it you'd rub on it Google SX70 manipulation. You'll, you'll see examples. You'd rub on it, um, and you would change. Give it. You could kind of blend the, like if you would rub on like somebody's shirt. You could kind of blend the colors in together and make it have it, give it this like cartoonish look. Or people would Weird. like draw little lines and dots on things, stuff like that. I had no but idea Polar you could do that. Yeah, when Polaroid went out of business, they quit making that. And then, then there was the Polaroid peel apart pack film, and there there was a one of those that we used to, I don't remember which one it was, but you drop it in hot water uh -huh. and and then the emulsion would kind of lift off. 
and you could kind of nudge it, and it would be this very thin little gelatin, colored gelatin layer, and you could peel it off and then drop it on a piece of watercolor paper and kind of smudge it around and then let it dry, and you would have a print on watercolor paper. Those were pretty cool. Oh, that's It's almost like an early version of uh, what they do now for um, graphics, putting graphics on stuff, the hydro dipping. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what that is. I'll, that one. Well, hydro uh, dipping is more graphic. Yeah, it's basically oh, yeah. they have like a printed film that they put on a top of a bucket of water, and then you, whatever you want to put that graphic on, you dip into the water, and it oh, flies it. I've seen, I've seen that, I've seen like YouTube videos. Yeah, of that, if it's what yeah. I'm thinking yeah. of. Yeah, that's it's, it's good for when you want to put a graphic on a very complex shape, like a motorcycle helmet or a guitar yeah. or a gun. Yeah, have you done that? I have not. I've seen it done, but I have not done it myself. Yeah, I've only seen it on t- on the internet. I haven't seen it in the world. I didn't know it was like I thought it was just like a, a really rare thing. But uh, no, I don't know. Pol- that's pretty cool. Polaroid made this stuff for a long time too. It's uh, it was called Type Fifty Five, and um, it was four by five. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I had my job doing product photography, four by five camera, we always see it. Polaroid film was a in medium and large format was really for proofing because mm-hmm. we would shoot slide film for publications and with slide film you had no real latitude like with negative film you had to nail your exposure if you overexposed or underexposed it wasn't going to work um so when we would do things where we set like all these lights up and we had like little room settings and stuff like that we would get everything set up you know use the light meter to set up all the flashes and then we would shoot a Polaroid and then adjust exposure based on how it looked. And, oh, um, that's, yeah, I've, I've seen that done. Yeah, but since I was able to order all my own supplies, I ordered the Type 55 because I was like, well, shit, we need, we need 50 sheets <laughs> to, get, <laughs> to get through this thing that requires 20 because some of them are coming home with me. But uh, <laughs> it, 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 it was a black and white print and in between the paper and the the coating paper, the backing paper, there was a Veracrome pan negative, which was an ISO 32 black and white film that it would instantly process. And it was just the neatest stuff. But uh, they quit making it. So there what was, was so special that, about that? Uh, the fact that you got a, a print and a negative and it processed right there in front of you. Oh, uh, okay, okay. Okay, I mean, what well, I was thinking, yeah, this is I'd... like... It, to get a negative, this it, and it was just there was something. It would have this um where it was attached at the end. There was like these little little marks mm-hmm. where it was clamped in, and then at the at the other end, you would have like a little streak where the chemicals kind of streaked across it. And it was just it, this is before we had Photoshop to create different yeah, looks sure. and things. So it was uh you know it was it was a lot. Nowadays, it, it's probably most younger people would look at it nowadays and probably go, yeah, what's so special about that? <laughs> <laughs> I could do a lot better job in like five minutes. <laughs> you know? Yeah, but it's not as fun. Uh, Instagram it, well, has a filter for that. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not as, it's not as fun, but it, it's not as fun. And back then you were the only person doing it. It wasn't sure. like, you know, except for like one other cool guy you might meet somewhere would be doing it, you know, <laughs> but, but it wasn't like a lot of people were doing it. So, I don't know, and these guys, these guys tried uh, to bring it back. They uh, they had a Kickstarter about five or six years ago. It was called New Fifty Five, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, I never backed it. They 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 did it. They were they were one of the few Kickstarters that's been successful, and they produced it. I think they've quit producing it, but it was a, uh, I was like a hundred dollars for ten sheets of it or something. Oh jeez, so. that's painful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, that's that's why it didn't work. I mean, even the Instax stuff is like a buck a sheet, right, Stephen? You shoot that? Um, I, it depends on how you buy it, but it's usually between fifty cents and a dollar. Yeah. Jeez, yeah. yeah. That's, that's painful. Yeah, well, Polaroid when always. One hundred twenty-eight gig SD cards are like twenty bucks. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. that's another thing with you know shooting film. It forces you to slow down and. Th- think about yes what your the image you're going to take you know if i'm out shooting digital you know 
shoot 100, 200, 300 pictures. doesn't matter. Yeah, you're going to have to sort through them later, but you know, go ahead and take them while you, while you can and figure it out later. With yeah. film, you got to think. Okay, you know, I've only got so many shots on this roll. Is the is this shot worth it? Do I have everything correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and is this something I actually yeah. want a photograph of? Is this worth fifty yeah. cents or a dollar? Yeah, and that, that's just you know the cost of film. If you're talking about something that is an instant, you still got to process and, it. Yeah. Like me, in dark room, you got to yeah. send it off to the lab and pay to have it processed and scanned and. It, it really changed expectations on things like that, too, that when digital photography came out. Mm-hmm. Um, I know going back for a lot of, since we've been on this quarantine, I've been going through old film negatives and stuff, you know. You know, like with a lot of assignments at work, you know, I might shoot four or five rolls of film, and I'm looking to turn in, because we're doing printed publications versus internet as part of it. But, uh, you know, I'm looking, you know, five, six really good photos was my end goal. Mm-hmm. Um, nowadays, you know, I go to a football game and, you know, within 30, 45 minutes of the game coming to an end, I've probably got 80 photos online with people looking at them and sharing them around and stuff already. Yeah. So it's 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 a lot. You know, it's it's you're expected to turn out a lot more. Yes, Definitely. And that, that changed almost, that changed, like, I, I remember the, the, the first digital camera I got at work. I mean, it, it that expectation changed the afternoon that I got it out of the box. And it was very, very quick. It's interesting. Um, and it's evolved since then where it's, 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 it's more and more and more. Now, now they're, now I've got like a little thing on the side of the camera that's a little transmitter and I, I carry a Verizon MiFi so that. When I get a decent shot, I can edit it in the camera and then upload a JPEG to an FTP site while I'm standing there in the middle of a graduation or an event, and some other guy can pull it off and put it on Twitter. That's and crazy. I, I just can I go back to work. And uh, you know that's yeah, it's it's changed things a lot. I don't know where it's all going still. Yeah. Um, and let's let's actually just kind of keep keep on that um, let's keep on that vein and talk a little bit about social media and photography. Um, I was going to ask whether you thought that digital cameras allowed social media to exist, or whether social media kicked off digital cameras. But honestly, they kind of just rolled up together at the same time. Um, how well, has I, it? I, I, I might digital just, I cameras came along way before. Yeah, no, I think without digital cameras, you would not have social media. To, okay. And, you know, something like Instagram could not exist, you know, if people had to, you know, scan prints to put up photos on there. Maybe, maybe it would, but, you know, not in the way that it does, that it's yeah. presented to We also have to realize that Instagram yeah. is second-gen social media. First-gen social media was like uh, MySpace and early, early Facebook. And even that could be considered second gen if you take it compared to like the older, like the message boards and things like that. Yeah. But I guess social media is we think about it. Back in the days when you had to have a .edu email address to sign up for Facebook. Yep. I remember that. (laughs) Um, Well, I mean, when you had to be a student as well. I mean, I, I remember when I had a student worker that was on it and, um, Speaking of Facebook, I posted a Facebook memory today, which was a, his graduation portrait. That's fine. I remember I had a, a student worker that was on Facebook before, when you had when only college students could be on it, and he used to use it to find names of people that he was writing captions for. Oh, that's cool. That's a good use. Of yeah, that. and then like, and then I think mean, it was like a year later they opened it up to everybody else. Mm-hmm. And it's been a time suck ever since. And that's yep. and it's really the only social media that I know very well. I, I have a Twitter and an Instagram, but I I think the last time I posted something on Instagram was probably I don't know, three or four months ago and I look through it like maybe once a month, that's about it. And I really just never found a fascination with Twitter. Mm-hmm. Oh, so I've yeah, tried. I'm- I'm the opposite. I, I, I've never used Twitter, but I'm on Instagram every day, just scrolling yeah. there. And I try, I try to at least for my professional work to post something once a day, just to keep people interested. 
Um, yeah. So what we're on the I'll, uh, I'll, about... I'll connect with you after this conversation so we can see what you do. Yeah, yeah definitely do that. Like I do think that. you guys would like each other's Mine's, stuff. Uh, you shoot similar things. Um, at DC Photo 307 is mine. And yeah, mine is, um, I've just got two. Uh, it's Stephen Tillman photo is my kind of my personal one. And then I've got, um, and then my business one is a little more complicated. TLH underscore real underscore estate underscore picks. Uh, and yeah. for both of you, I will have you guys give me the text links for those. And I'll make sure yeah. that they're posted under this video. So, um, so people can, can go find that stuff because they're going to want to see what you guys are doing. Um, but now with social media, um, do you find it a benefit that, that people can see your stuff or do you find it enough of a time sink that it might eat into people, um, seeing your, your, your stuff? And I think maybe a more important question would be, um, does it change what you shoot? And, uh, David go. Uh, well, I guess with social media, you know, I, uh, it doesn't really change what I shoot. Okay. Um, it changes at work. It changes how quickly I try to get things out. Mm -hmm. Uh, just, you know, sometimes we want things real quick. Uh, um, I've actually found, you know, here recently, some of the things that I've enjoyed being on social media the most are things that I shot years ago that are throwback posts. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you know, people see their old college pictures, and I, I had some. Uh, I heard from a, a girl that went to ASU back in the days, and it was something we posted a couple weeks ago there, and I was like, "Oh, thank you for holding on to all our memories." Blah 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 blah, and all this. And I was just like, you know, that just made me so happy that it, something I did made some, gave somebody that allowed. And, and that's the whole beauty of photography. I mean, you know, it's it's from. From the the minute photography started, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's digital or film or social media or or prints in the darkroom or whatever. You're you're catching these little moments in life and you're saving them. It's like you mm -hmm. click the shutter and it's it's a one one twenty fifth of a second of human life was recorded. It was visually recorded forever. Mm -hmm. And years years later, people see it and it brings back memories. It tells stories. Um, uh, it, it's. I think it, it, it's a tool for photojournalists. It's done more to. Ch it's done more to enact social change in our world than any other tool ever. And there's no form of art that conveys messages the same way. Not even close. Not music. Not yeah. drawing. Not painting. Yeah, definitely. Uh, not anything. There's and it's. Uh, it's the whole world has uh, been a better, mostly been a better place because <laughs> of it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and all, all the way back to from the time Matthew Brady was shooting slave portraits mm -hmm. uh, up until uh, you know you know throughout the Industrial Revolution to the de the Great Depression and and on, it, it's been the one thing that's that's put people in touch with life. And uh, so I, I guess uh, I'll probably Stephen should probably talk more about social media because you know I'm older. <laughs> Um, well, yeah, but, but you've seen it come you got, to be. You guys are talking about like, up in it. first and second gen social media, and I'm like, well, I have a Facebook page. <laughs> I mean, I really, I, I don't really, I've never been one to use any of this other stuff. I'm also, I'm a staff photographer. Um, I'm an employed photographer, so if I was on my own, mm -hmm. now, if, if I was, if I was not uh, a staff photographer, if I was running my own business, and yeah, that's a whole other world, yeah. um, I would be constantly I, nowadays you have to constantly get on social media and use it to promote yourself and i watch other people i watch especially younger people that are doing it and um it, it, it's interesting to me it's uh i'm glad it's not the world i'm in yeah but um but yeah you, you have to you have to master it and i guess i guess if i was doing if i was a freelancer i would probably uh i would probably put much more into that um i'm trying to learn more about it now just because you know it's what we have i work at a university and it's what we have to do to engage young people and as, mm -hmm. as well as young alum um so I, I guess i guess i i have a pretty good knowledge of the things that work in that way but uh mm -hmm. i don't know i'm kind of going off on tangents nope, again that's so. fine. uh mm -hmm. and and steven do you find that do you find that you shoot specifically for social like is there 
photography you do for yourself and photography you do for the internet or have you found that um, you've been able to get it all together or that the stuff you put out just happens to be what other people want to see yeah i don't think i shoot anything specifically for social media i'm never taking a photo thinking oh gosh this is going to get a bunch of likes on instagram but i do enjoy really, are you lying to me right now <laughs> No, I, I, I take the pictures I enjoy and then hope other people enjoy. And I'm glad that social media is there because I can. it gives me an audience that I just otherwise would never have. I can put a hashtag on something and some random person halfway across the world gets to see my photo. And mm -hmm. that, that makes me just that much happier. Um, yeah, that's also, so cool. I, I think not just uh, Instagram, but other forms of media, especially YouTube and a lot of the photography vloggers on there kind of have pushed me to do better work yeah, seeing the, the quality of work that is out there and gets attention I would, so, that's that's the best thing about social media to me yeah. there so maybe yeah, I've got a connect the connections yeah. I have with other people mm -hmm. um, so not maybe what I shoot has changed because of social media but how I shoot it um, mm -hmm. the the level of quality of stuff I'm happy with, you know, it, it's pushed me to try harder and harder to make better images. Yeah, and, definitely. you know, I, I look at, you know, old calendars and things and stuff kind of before social media and look at, you know, what passed for postcard images and calendar images in those days. And it's like, well, this is mediocre work. And now it's, you know, you know, if you want people to pay attention to it, it's got to be top notch. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and speaking of strange things that do well on social media, um, let's flip back a little bit to technology. I just want to cover it just because I've got you here, Stephen. And mm -hmm. um, let's talk a little bit about your drone stuff, because that's something oh, that cool. neither David nor I do. And uh, it's just cool. Uh, yeah, drones are a lot of fun. Um, so explain what your drone is first. Uh, I have a DJI Mavic 2 Pro. Uh, it's and what does it know, do? Uh, it's I I look at it just as it's a camera that I can put in places I otherwise couldn't put a camera. You know, like 400 feet in the air. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I primarily bought it for doing real estate photos and videos. That's that's its job is to make me money doing that. Mm -hmm. um, but I like using it for, you know, landscape photos and cityscapes. Um, you know, I live in a very flat part of the world. Uh, there's no mountains within sight. And, um, and I'm surrounded by pine trees. <laughs> so if there's a really nice sunset that I want to take a picture of, it's really great to just be able to put the drone up in the air and, you know, shoot it that way. Yeah. Yeah, I'll have to connect to you with a buddy of mine. He lives up here. It's, he's a, a drone guy, and he, he's real estate photography, kind of his thing. He, yeah. um, he does, he, he uses the drone for that. We've hired him a couple times at ASU to come out and do stuff, too. Which I'm, uh, I'm eventually going to get one. It's just the, the whole getting the license and everything. Yeah, that's the one of the difficulties. If you want to do it legally commercially you have to be licensed by the faa uh, it's yeah. called a, a a part 107 license and, and you also have to register a fight flight plan every time you're doing it right uh it depends on where i'm flying okay. um if i am in what's considered controlled airspace which is usually anywhere within five miles of an airport mm -hmm. You have to file a flight plan, which is just basically how long you're going to be flying in about what area. Mm -hmm. And but the FAA has automated that, so I send in the flight plan, and within a few seconds, I get a text on my phone that says, "Okay, you're approved." Cool. And, so it's just kind of make sure yeah. there's not too much stuff in the air in one spot. Yeah, one of yeah. my uh, one of my favorite drone stories. We uh. At Alabama State, we're in close proximity to our local airport, and uh, we we built a football stadium a few years ago. And we hired this guy who's my my friend Brian here. He does the drone stuff. Um, he's and he's a really nice guy. He's on Facebook. The guy like lives on Facebook. He like more than anyone. I, and more, but for people my age, he's like on their much as if 
more than anyone I know. I hope he doesn't know this. <laughs> but uh, you have to edit that part out. But, uh, but he's a super nice guy. But um, he came and uh, there's also a hospital. We're sitting next to an interstate and there's a hospital on the other side of the interstate. And he was about to go up and shoot stills of this new stadium. And um, so he called in the, the thing. He, I guess he knows the guys at the tower at the base. And he calls in and they said, no, sir, not till 630. Huh, it's like there's yeah. a, a heliport there. Yeah, exactly. Is that? And he said, he said, well, okay. Well, he had to charge. He had a battery to charge anyway, so he plugged his battery in. He said he was just sitting there in the back of his truck. Um, because he just he parks his pickup truck next to the thing and just flies the thing right out, out the back there. And uh, so he said he just sat there and was playing around. And he said like just a couple minutes later, uh, the life flight helicopter came in and it came directly over this like 15 feet over the top of the stadium and down to the hospital yep. so he would have been right directly in its flight path yep yeah you got to be real careful time. with um you know usually unless you are very close to an airport you're not gonna have to worry about planes but um helicopters tend to fly i've noticed i see helicopters flying lower than they should a lot of times yeah um, so you got to be careful and that, my drone actually has a feature where if you hold the control sticks in just the right way it will cut power to the motors and it will fall out of the sky in an emergency situation yeah thankfully i have wow. never had to use that <laughs> yeah because it also but hits the ground at you know full speed yeah well i've i saw one person testing it out they put the drone up to 400 feet which is as high as you can legally fly in the u.s mm-hmm and they cut power and then tried to turn it back on. And they actually got the drone to turn back on, power up, and hover before it hit the ground. Well, that's good. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, and your so. drone is one of the ones that does all, like, the... It, it can station hold and all that stuff, right? Oh, yeah. It's got... It basically flies itself. Yeah. You just give um, it points to go to, and it goes to those places. Yeah, I mean, it, you can manually control it, but if I let go of the sticks, it's just going to stay wherever I put it. Yeah. Hey, do you, you have the one with the Hasselblad lens on it. Yeah, the, the quote unquote Hasselblad. I'd say, you know, I finally bought a Hasselblad and, you know, <laughs> and it yeah. flies. And you shove it into uh, the sky every day. Yeah, I think it's basically it's a Sony one inch sensor, and Hasselblad yeah. put some of their color science into the processing, and that's about it. But I shoot raw anyway, so the color processing. Oh, is it? Is, is it a Zeiss lens on it? Um, I don't think so. Um, I think oh, it's, it, it, says, it says Hasselblad on the front of it. Yeah, I think it is a straight Hasselblad yeah. lens on a Sony sensor. I do not think Zeiss is involved in it, but if I could get that lens and sensor combo yeah. on a point-and-shoot, I would well, definitely Zeiss, have Zeiss, one. Zeiss, Zeiss, Zeiss makes all the glass in Hasselblad lenses. Oh, then they may have had something to do hmm. with it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now I'm kind of curious. It's a Swiss camera company with, Steven, with don't German leave. glass. You can look at it I'm later. I'm not leaving. <laughs> the drone is right behind me. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I think the drones are just so interesting because it's a point of view that has, up to the last few years, been so incredibly expensive because you had to go in a helicopter or in an airplane yeah. and get um, that shot. And, and now, I actually, I had a, a job recently um, come up. I didn't end up shooting it, but. There was an apartment complex that a company wanted me to shoot that was too close to the airport to use a drone for. Mm -hmm. And they were like, well, we really want these shots. You know, it's a whole apartment complex. It's you know going to sell for millions of dollars. Um, yeah. It's worth renting a helicopter to get these shots for. Oh, and that's cool. Did thankfully, they've now yeah. changed the rules where I can fly there. Yeah. Um, but you just but, have yeah, to be uh, more careful and... Yeah, it's yeah. basically they made it where it's you're limited in altitude. The closer you get to the airport, the lower and lower you're allowed to fly. That makes good sense. Yeah. Uh, I, I looked at the drone. It does not say Zeiss anywhere on the front of the lens, but oh. know, who, it, who knows what's really under there. Yeah, nowadays, yeah, like, Tamron makes designs of everybody's stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, so did you, did you use a helicopter to shoot the apartment complex? Uh, it, it ended up being uh, someone else actually ended up shooting it. Um, they waited uh, basically. It wasn't very long before the drone rules changed, and yeah. uh, they ended up using their staff drone guy. I've only I've only been able to shoot out of a helicopter once, and it was just last year. Oh, and how was, was that? It was wonderful. It was like one of my best days I ever had. At work. <laughs> um, and it wasn't. It was a. Um, it was a Huey. 
Oh, nice. I, the, the way I got the hookup was uh, our we have a guy at ASU that used to be the head of the Alabama State Troopers. So ah. he just made, and it, so it didn't even cost us anything. They, uh, he talked to me. And they said, "Yeah, we go on training flights, and we have they have to go on these flights where they go and survey things and stuff." And said, "Since where we were, where our the campus is, they said that I could just ride along, and when they got done doing what they had to do, then um, they would find me around campus and let me take pictures." Oh, that's awesome! And and, uh, and they were like, "You don't mind? If we have to ride around." I was like, "Hell, I don't mind." What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> and they they actually wound up flying directly over this place where I go, I go fishing. I have a kayak and I paddle my kayak around there and fish. And it's a really neat place to take pictures. Cause there's like, like an old movie set in the middle of it and everything too. And oh, that's so they where, like, um, what, the big what, fish. Yeah. Movie. Big fish was shot there. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and they flew me over there. Then they flew me over this, this swamp area that I've been wanting to go photograph. So I was able to like try to figure out where I can and can't paddle in. <laughs> and they were like, but they're like, sorry, it's taking a little more time than we thought before we get you to campus. I was like, man, you can ride around all day. I don't care. <laughs> I'm and, on a uh, helicopter. This is fun. What are you talking about? Oh, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and, and what was cool about it, it wasn't like – see, everyone I know that's, that's shot out of them, they get in these little things where you have to, like, stick your feet out the side on the, on the landing rod and, and be aware of the draft and everything. Well, these guys have a door that opens, and it's, like, six feet high and eight feet wide. And I'm sitting in the gun. It was like a gunner seat where, you know, like if it was yeah, a military, that's perfect. Yeah. there yeah. would be a, a machine gun there. Like an M2 would be mounted on a, a thing there. But I'm sitting there on the seat and it's just like a, a giant window view of the whole world. And I was just like, I was, and they were just like, it's in the like, candy like, store. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, mm. it was amazing. Yeah. It was like the coolest thing. I, it, it, I was like, man, you guys have a much. You guys are the only people I know that have a cooler job than me. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing you, do you this had. Every day. Uh, I'm guessing you had the tightest grip you've ever had on your camera, though. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the thing is, though, it, what it's it's like when you usually when I've I've done aerials, you get a Cessna because the Cessna is cheap. Like to rent to actually rent a helicopter is incredibly expensive. Yeah. Um, to rent a Cessna is not. I mean, it's like a hundred bucks for an hour, and mm. uh. But in the Cessna, it's like you got your pilot and you're, you're and, and I'm kind of a big guy. I'm like 230 pounds. And so, you know, you got your pilot and your elbows and his elbow are touching and then your other elbows touching the door. And then you open this little window and you have to like you put all your shit behind you, but you have to get all the stuff out of the bag and set it in your lap before you take off. Because once you're in the air, you don't have enough room to turn around. Mm-hmm. And you know, so you're kind, you kind of like lean out the side and like twist a little bit and try to stay out of the airstream. And in the helicopter, it, it's there's no with the Huey anyway. There's no you don't feel any downdraft at all. Oh, that's cool. I mean, because hmm. the way the top the top of the helicopter is big enough to where it's. I mean, you would actually have to climb out and stick your arm out into the air to feel it. And there's not even any wind coming in the thing. Um, it's just it's just like there's a big fourth. Of, or six foot by eight foot window and and you're just like sitting there and it's just it's amazing the only problem yeah the only problem with it is like with the cessna you can go up to six thousand feet that they they couldn't take the helicopter that high in the airspace in the hover yeah because there's like it's like planes come through or whatever so we were down a lot lower we have the issue with the military base too where that that has a different a different yeah allowable yeah that's right allowable airspace yeah yeah we have yeah. we have a major air force base and we have a major air force base here in town and then we have an airport and then at the airport we also have a national guard squadron yeah and there's and, a hospital and, right by the university campus so yeah. that's a yeah, they complicated have the, they have airspace the helicopter pad and yeah 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 so so we we didn't get as much altitude as i would have liked so they're, they're kind of wide shots a lot of them but it was uh the helicopter yeah, that itself, is just, just being well, in a helicopter was amazing. I want to be a. Hel- I'd, I'd love to be a helicopter pilot. <laughs> yeah. well, okay, I could be, I just, the, that would just be the coolest thing in the world. Back to the drones. Yeah. One of my kind of major disappointments is that I can't fly any higher than 400 feet. But that's There's legal lot. reasons, right? Yeah, that's legal reasons. The drone yeah. is could do it. Can go up to 500 meters, however many feet that is. Which is 1,400 feet or something like that. Or yeah, no, it's more than that. It's like 1,700 yeah, feet. It's more like 1,700, yeah. yeah. So the, the drone can go ridiculously high, but 
um, just for legal reasons, 400 feet is, you know, where I'm stuck at. Uh, yeah. But there's a lot of situations where I'm like, man, it'd be really cool if I could get up higher. Just a little more. bit more. Yeah. Especially if I'm shooting like a large property, like I, I get asked to shoot um, farmland a lot. And, you know, 100 acres, it's like, the, you know, the only way to shoot this is to, you know, I can't shoot it from directly above. I've got to pull back it really far away and shoot it at an angle. Okay, so this is super nerdy and a uh, total tangent, but is the flight ceiling higher if it's unpowered? Um, Because I almost oh, wonder I if you could just know. shoot up like a glider a on a kite. rocket and then just glide it back um. down. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the rules are for that. That would that would fall under a completely different classification. Yeah. Basically, well, any yeah, I, the, I think people the fly FAA claims higher than that. Yeah, the FAA claims jurisdiction over anything in the air. It doesn't matter if it's a paper airplane. Yeah. Um. You know, if it's outside in the air, they claim jurisdiction. But over I mean, it, people sure. do model rocketry that goes to the edge of space. Yeah, yeah, they do that out in the uh, desert, though. That's they true. don't do it around town. Yeah, but I've if you did it out in the desert and did a slow glide back, you could get what you wanted. I've also seen videos of people with those pair. The the basically they've got a parachute and a big fan on their back. Oh god, those yeah. look lethally dangerous. They look like fun, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, they do look very dangerous. But I've seen them go to ridiculously high altitudes, um, over ten thousand feet. Um, yeah, they yeah, fly ultralights like that too. Yeah, uh, I don't, I don't know, I don't know what the rules are around that, but well, I think, I think, I, I, well, if you're your part one hundred and seven, it's an unmanned aerial system. So I think when it's unmanned is where your four hundred foot ceiling comes in. When it's manned, that's yeah, it's that's it different. has to be it's unmanned and it has to weigh less than fifty five pounds. That's big, uh, but, but more than point five five pounds. Fifty five pounds. I, don't know, I had to weigh under fifty five. It's like those big. Those big, uh, those things, the the big, like eight. Oh, they're like the, the octocoppers. octocoppers yeah, the, the, yeah. You the, think about something SLRs, like that. Those things weigh more than fifty-five pounds. That's though. true. Yeah, you think about something like that with a big cinema camera on yeah. it. That thing's gonna have some weight to it. Just imagine one of those things falling out of the sky. Ugh. Oh yeah, no, that's just the cost of it falling out of the sky. Yeah, that's why I'm. You know, my drone wasn't cheap, but it wasn't ridiculously expensive either, and I think. Any more than that much money flying up in the air would just make me too nervous. It, yeah. it wouldn't be worth it to me anymore. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I can't imagine like putting a D5 on one of those things. <laughs> well, and oh, that's, yeah. a, that's actually a good point. Not a just six thousand dollar camera and a two thousand dollar lens and a what, that's, $10, that's actually an interesting yeah. thing because, like, at least for me, not even with drones, but like when I first got my Sony, it was my baby, and I babied it for like two weeks and then i was like screw it it's just a camera it's just a tool i'm gonna take it everywhere i'm gonna beat it up i'm gonna do whatever i want with it um what how do you guys deal with that like how do you guys switch from it being like the new fancy to tool to just like something that you have and you just accept that it might die at some point in the future um for me it's having enough of self-insurance that if it broke i could replace it okay <laughs> Um, so, so you just so when you buy a fifteen hundred dollar camera, you just put another fifteen hundred dollars in the bank. Yeah, it's and it's like that for things that I use to make money. You know, I yeah. use my camera to make money, so make sure that hmm. you know if someone even if not necessarily it breaking or me tearing it up or someone breaks into my car and steals it. Yeah, you know. I got to be able to replace at least enough of that equipment. I can keep making money. Mm -hmm. David, how do you how do you switch? Or is it um, just tools from day one? Yeah, I mean they're all tools. I mean, I don't know. Uh, well, and actually, my, do, sorry, go. Like with my personal equipment. Yeah, um, yeah, with your personal stuff. Your work stuff doesn't count because it's not yours. <laughs> yeah yeah um well yeah e even with my work stuff i'm always budget conscious i ask them to get me what i need not necessarily you know what i want yeah, yeah. but uh with my personal stuff you know yeah, yeah i get what i can afford and yeah i don't worry about it i just use it i mean i try I, I, i'm probably uh i'm one of those guys a lot of people would probably cringe at when they realize how i, I sometimes don't be real careful about 
putting something back in the bag or I'm taking it out in the rain or whatever. But yeah, you know, it's, if you worry about that, I think if with any kind of gear, even with the work stuff or the personal stuff, if you worry too much about it, um, you don't, you don't, you don't use it. Yeah. It stops being a tool if you have to take care of it. Yeah. 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 One thing I've realized. Stuff happens. Yeah. Once you get into some of the higher end equipment, it's made to be used professionally and oh yeah. yeah you still need to treat it nicely but you know you don't have to well, worry okay. that much about it like the uh, the slr the dslr camera i have at work um you know people will, will ask you know about that and ask me to compare it to other cameras that nikon makes and you know it it may cost four times yeah. what a lot of other cameras which really have just as good of a sensor and is really just as good of a camera and probably not as likely to give me tendonitis and risk. <laughs> um, it, yeah. it probably, you, said uh, you, you said you shoot with a D5? Yeah, yeah. yeah it, that's, it, that's, it, um, that's, no, that's no small camera. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, at some point, if you work you know, five and six days a week, at some point, you're going to drop it. You're, it's going to, you take it in and out of a camera bag three or four times a day, change lenses several times, um, probably fire the shutter, you know, a hundred times more than any amateur photographer would. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, 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 it's going to wear out. And, you know, if, you know, if, if ASU has a moment when some famous politician comes to see the president or, you know, there's a, a big football game or, or whatever, you can't have the camera break down in the middle of it. Yeah. You, know, you got to have something that's going to last. So it's sometimes that a lot of times that's what's like that. That's really what you pay for with a camera like that. The the body's made out of magnesium and it's reinforced and it's weather sealed. And I mean, we had a football game last year where it stormed like you know, I mean, it just constantly stormed. Um, I remember having to to go on the sideline in the team area and crawl up underneath a table to change lenses <laughs> when uh, the, the president of the university was coming down for like a group photo on the field. And I was like, all my stuff is in Ziploc bags inside of my camera bag. So I had to like, when there's like a few minutes left in the second quarter before this halftime thing, I had to crawl up underneath this table because there's no other way to get shelter from the rain. And it, it your less expensive cameras just wouldn't have functioned yeah, they just wouldn't have made that. it at all. Yeah. So I mean, I don't, I don't know if I'm answering your question. No, yeah, that, that's exactly what I was looking for. I think that I okay. think that there's an issue, especially with amateurs, is that they buy this thing and it, they just keep seeing that dollar value on it. Yeah. And they don't ever give it. They don't ever let that go, and so it well, it's, it gets weird, yeah. and then you miss the shot, right? It's it's hard to justify a six for camera. Well, I'll, I'll yes, say your camera stuff those, like that to all those amateurs. I still have the DSLR that I was shooting with in 2005. Yeah. And it's only recently stopped working, but that was because I took it apart and messed with it. I thought it still <laughs> worked. I thought it's an IR. Uh, well, I did. I converted it to infrared, but the autofocus has seemed to stop working. Oh, well, that's fine. Uh-huh. You can manually focus it. You're an adult. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's, yeah, I, yeah. I converted a, an old point and sheet years ago, and it just quit working a couple of years ago. I want another one. I think we all have our love little collection of strange things. Oh yeah, that's one. I've, that's one of the things that's always fascinated me is IR photography. And since Kodak quit making making their HIE film, I've been kind of not really knowing what to do. Well, I've, I've got a roll. I've got I've just a got roll my, of film, but I just okay. bought it's a, a Russian film. It's called a Zvima mm-hmm. film, and they make and it's sensitive out to like eight hundred nanometers, but oh, I, cool. I haven't developed it yet. Yeah, Stephen, how did you how did you do yours? Uh, well, most digital cameras are sensitive to infrared, mm-hmm. but they have a little glass filter over the sensor that blocks infrared light. Yeah, and most cameras, all you got to do is take it apart down to where you can get that piece of glass off the sensor, and uh, then you have to put another piece of glass either over the lens or over the sensor to block visible visible light. spectrum light. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and I've actually, I've still got my first Sony that I got, I think in 2013. Man, you're better than um, I am. I destroy stuff. Well, you're still shooting with your, your Sony, right? Yeah, but it's only like five years old. 
Yeah. Well, it, it's I, already I've, missing like parts of its grips and stuff. <laughs> oh yeah, my, mine's not in great shape, but it still works. But uh, I've been very tempted to. It's been kind of my backup camera in case, you know, things get stolen or broken. I've still yeah. got that camera to rely on, but I haven't had that problem yet. And so I've been really tempted to convert that camera to infrared, so I'd have a a full frame mirrorless infrared camera. I think would be really cool to have. Yeah, I really want to do the um, the thin sensor stack, so the camera works better with film lenses. But it's like four hundred dollars, and that's just not worth it for that tiny bit of extra sharpness. Um, twelve megapixels yeah. is twelve megapixels. It's just not that sharp. Um, yeah. Now, while we're talking about all of our silly toys, uh, there's something in the photography community called gas, which is and gear I, I acquisition. Have a gas. Yeah, gear acquisition syndrome. And it's the thing where when photographers buy a piece of equipment, they just want the better one or the next one or the weirder one yep. or whatever. And I think that to an extent, mm. and actually in very different ways, I think the three of us all have that. Uh, yeah, it's, it's David, everything. David though. probably it's, less than us. but It's, it's a, you know, I mean, I, okay, like I used to be, and, and I just want to get back into it, but I used to be really into cycling. And, mm. um, you know, it's the same, it's, whether it's bicycling or you know, even in skateboarding, I mean, you know, you, you get like, oh, this, these wheels are, you know, it's it, it's ev everything that requires any kind of equipment. People get fascinated with that, but uh, I don't know. Okay, so for so I think to make it specific to photography, what is the most absurd thing you own for photography? Whether it be a lens or a camera body or some <laughs> accessory. Uh, um. Shit, I don't know. What Steven, about you, Steven? Do you want to go first? Um, probably my 150 to 600 millimeter lens. That's um, that's the silliest. It's a pretty that's silly, silly lens. <laughs> uh, well, considering I don't shoot sports, and I only yeah, started that's more shooting, of a wildlife lens. <laughs> yeah, well, I only started shooting wildlife after I bought it. <laughs> and, and for um, the listeners at home. <laughs> See how they're justifying it to each other? Yeah. <laughs> no, that's a good. That's a that's a good tool. Oh yeah. Is that no. That's that's like, no. If I, I was going to go out and shoot wildlife more, I mean, I know I know a couple of guys that they're real into shooting like birds and stuff. Like um, you know, like I know one one guy he has a blind. He goes and sits in, and the other one goes out on a boat, and they they shoot pictures of eagles and stuff like that. And some of them are just incredible shots. Um. But yeah, I, I don't know if it's the same lens you're using, but yeah, they've got it's like a, it's like a yeah. four five five six or something. It goes out. Yeah, it's it's, like, it's like, similar to that. It's a just a cheap uh, Tamron, um, and I got it off of Craigslist for I think less than half what it would have cost new retail. Yeah. Um, so yeah. it's it's not that ridiculous, but it's one of the more ridiculous pieces of equipment I own. Um, yeah, I've got a two hundred to four hundred f or it work but i've never shot wildlife with it it's not mine and yeah so i don't i don't take it out on the kayak but david you have that whole anyway. collection of film stuff and you don't have an absurd piece of equipment in there something that you just know is silly even if it's useful maybe um, that rotating lens camera we were talking about earlier <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> well that camera is actually no that camera is actually not silly and it's not it was i've actually uh I, you know, I'm like you know, like on those trips I've done to South America and and a couple of different places, I've used those rotating lens cameras and, and gotten some really neat images. Um, oh yeah, I used to carry it a lot at ASU when I first started working there, especially when we were using film. And it was always just generating uh, cool stuff. I I get if I had to pick anything that I do more than other photographers do or maybe that's like my little niche it's panoramic stuff i do a lot of stitching oh, okay like shooting architecture and stuff i do a lot of stitching and landscape I do that kind of thing with digital cameras too um Does and i've been doing D5 that do the auto stitch uh, i don't know but I, I i've got a I, my fuji i think will yeah but i don't i, I do it manually myself I, oh, okay. it doesn't work as well yeah yeah i do i i do i used to use I, I started doing that when digital cameras came out. There was a program that was like uh, uh, ArcSoft Panorama Maker. Yeah. And I was I using that. I remember that. Yeah. It's, and then when Photoshop started doing 
it was actually a lot better than Photoshop because you could drag little points in the images around yeah. to where they would line up. But Photoshop's got to where it, it does it so much better now. It's it's really good. Um, so now that camera, I wouldn't call that camera as absurd. It's neat. Um, what, what I have that's absurd? Um, it's got to be something. I well, got, like I've for, got so for example, um, I have a um, I have that X-ray lens. It's a uh, what is it? It's a uh, Rexar f.75 50 millimeter, but it doesn't focus on anything and it doesn't really process visible light correctly. But for Christmas, I get like amazing pictures of Christmas lights. That's like the one time a year I bust it oh, out I need and do some portraits. This. Oh, you haven't seen that? Yeah. What's the what's the what's the flange distance on it? Oh, it, it mounts to my Sony. Um, I actually oh. I actually have hmm. glued a mount to it for the Sony, and it's got like a focus range of like maybe five feet to ten feet or something like that. It's very very silly. Yeah, interesting. Um, but yeah, I'll send you some pictures from it sometime. Yeah. Um. What do I have that's absurd? Um. I don't know if it's absurd. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. That, that's a, that's it. I, uh, that camera that you printed for me, maybe that thing, it's just kind of, oh, yeah. I, I, I kind of miss using it. Um, did you break it? it? Oh, yeah, you said the lens. Up. You it said you to... broke the lens. Yeah. I remember. Yeah. It, well, it's jammed up. It needs to be sent off to get repaired. Um, and we actually, the flange distance was always just a little bit too long. The, it, it, instead of being at infinity, it's actually focused just a little closer. It's yeah. like when you open well, it up, you see, you see things drop off at the distance. Yeah. Um, and what's absurd? Um, <laughs> we can move on if you think all your stuff is. Here. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's all it's all useful. I don't have anything that's not useful in some way, shape, or another. Okay. Well, we are going to run a little long on this, but I think that's okay. Um, David, yeah, is, there anything, out all yeah, stuff. Yeah. is there anything that you want to talk about with photojournalism? Because we talked a tiny, tiny bit about it, but I think it's an important thing. And you brought up a, a, and you you sent me a few things about it. Um, if you wanted um, just the crash course for for freshmen, general kids who are taking art for the first time, what do you want them to know about photojournalism? And gosh, I'm, I'm excited um, to hear about this because I know absolutely nothing about photojournalism other than oh, okay, some gosh, of the, the the ethics of it. You know, yeah. Um, Don't stage pressure. photos. <laughs> yeah, no pressure. Yeah, no pressure. Um, gosh, you know, I started with uh, another professor at ASU has been wanting me to do a talk for his communications class, and, and mm -hmm. I think he thinks I've put him off, but I, I really haven't. I just it, we were really busy with uh, you know we at work you know we were going on that bus tour every yep. day and all this stuff and then as soon as that's over with and we start to recover from that there's a virus um uh -huh. so i never got to do that class uh, photojournalism gosh uh, i think photojournalism is the main thing that's driven the photographic industry mm -hmm. in one way or another since its inception since uh i couldn't i'm, I'm not good at dates i know like since not too long after you know the first, uh, not, not too long after Henry Fox Talbot invented this stuff. Yeah. And, uh, the wet plate photography came out in the early 19th century. Um, yeah. One story I always like to look at, like, uh, Matthew Brady. And most people know who Matthew Brady was. Uh, it, it, two of the most famous photographers of that era are Matthew Brady and Alexander Gardner. Mm -hmm. And Gardner was an apprentice of Brady's, and they both did a lot of photography in the Civil War. Uh, it brought a lot of attention to what, you know, prior up into that time, war was more of a glamorous kind of thing. Yeah. And when Gardner photographed pictures of dead bodies at the after and heat them, you know, people it really kind of started to hit home how terrible it was. Um, and one of the things, one of the things with Brady that really, uh, I, I guess you have to look, it, you have to look at how people got news back mm -hmm. then. Uh, there was the printing press changed the world dramatically. The printing press probably was as big of a change in in society and the whole human condition as photography was itself. But mm -hmm. you have to you have to know most people back then didn't know how to read. Yeah, it wasn't um you know if you if you were to go to a, a common place like Montgomery, Alabama in eighteen forty 
you know, you might find one out of 10 people are actually literate. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it may be two out of 10, but you know, not, not as many. There's no radio. The, the newspapers don't get out of the big cities as much. So you had these people that would go around and they would, they would talk, do talks. You had people that were traveling storytellers that would, you know, they would show up and there would be a town hall and people would come and sit and listen. Mm -hmm. And they'd talk about what, what was going on in Congress, what the president had said and done, things like that. And that's how people got information. So it's so like when the abolitionist movement was really taking off in that era, they would go and they were trying to recruit people to sign up for the Union Army. Mm -hmm. And um, they would they would go and they would do these talks. And they would – I remember one account that I was reading about with Brady – was they would go and it wasn't just Matthew Brady. There were other photographers that worked on this project too. But they, they would they went down to the South and they photographed the pictures of slaves. And uh, th these people they would go and they would talk about slavery and all this kind of stuff. And you know they would have like four or five people that would sign up to go fight. So they sent all these guys down to take these pictures. When they displayed the pictures, it would be like half of the able-bodied men that showed up. There would be like 50, 60 people would sign up. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of Brady's, a couple photos that Brady did that were real famous. There was one that was a portrait of a man's face, and it was just real detailed. And the one that everybody has seen, uh, there was a guy that had escaped from a plantation, and then he had been flogged, and his back is just covered in scars. So he's seated in a chair, and it's a photo of his back. I've seen that. And one. I think, yeah, everybody. If you haven't seen that photo, you haven't studied American history. Yeah. Um. But that that was a bit. That was something that. That enacted social change um and, and it was what photography did it so abruptly i mean there were there were people that were publishing newspapers and going and doing there was a there was a guy out of ohio elijah uh, i can't remember his name but he published a newspaper um and he traveled around the country passing out his newspapers but without pictures it just it never really got a lot of uh ground yeah, a lot of traction when brady's yeah when with brady's pictures you know and then you know you move into the 19th century the later 19th century throughout the industrial revolution people were seeing what was going on in the world because people were photographing it um you look at uh you know you know as, as westward expansion took place in our country you know you have the photographic records of what things were like with native mm -hmm. american life um oh who this guy that did all the photo gravure prints the and, uh, traveled out west and did um did all, spent his whole life photographing uh all that out there. Yeah, I don't remember, but I know who you're talking about. Um, I'm, I'm uh, name it's on the tip too. of my tongue. Um, Edward Curtis is who I'm trying to think. Edward of. Curtis. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and you look at uh, you, you, right up through all the World Wars, um. You know, since then we've lived with with images of things. It's like, uh, I think it's, like, it's sort of like it's like I was saying earlier. You know, every time you, you, you capture this little moment in life and you preserve it forever. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's it's beautiful things, and sometimes it's not. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the things I suggested we discuss was like the Farm Security Administration. Yeah, that was a big changing thing in photography. Uh, that started. I don't. No, it was in the 30s. I don't know what year. Mm -hmm. um, but pretty much what happened more or less was, uh, you know, we're in the height of the Depression, the Dust Bowl, um, a lot of real bad economic times. And I think a lot of people, I think the consensus was a lot of people didn't realize exactly what everyone was dealing with. Mm -hmm. So they, they hired these guys to go out and document it. Um Walker Evans was one of a big one. Dorothy, everyone knows Dorothea Lange because she has a the photo migrant mother. Um, yes, that's the the one with the mother and two children facing backwards. Uh, we definitely cover that yeah. one in class. Yeah, yeah I that's think a lot of people. Don't, people, a lot of people don't realize that photo is actually edited slightly. Well, it's also staged. Yeah, yeah, that's been that's been it. That's been it. well. She, he shot. She shot. It, it, she had asked her to what degree it was staged i mean she had asked her to sit down but yeah there was a, a well if you there's there's that you can actually the see the rest of that back. roll of film if you like yeah that, you can yeah. see how she staged it but no there was um yeah. no i think it was a thumb or something that you know this is yeah long it was, before it was, photoshop but 
there it was, was a something... hand that pulled the flap on the tent back so they could see her yeah. better. Yeah. 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 That's, that is, that's another f- famous story there. Um, Gordon Parks was a real, was a big part of the mm-hmm. farm security administration. Uh, Arthur Roth, Rothstein's, uh, there, there, there was about, I guess there was about a dozen of them that were, uh, that were involved. Walker Evans, Dorothea Lange, and Gordon Parks are probably the some of the most well known ones. Walker Evans, especially. Walker Evans traveled all over the country, and he he set out to document American life. Mm-hmm. Um, and was one of you know he was one he was one of the premier early modern photojournalist, I guess you could say. As, as it, you have to understand, when you go back to like the 19th century stuff and earlier, newspapers weren't printing photos as much. Um, there weren't there weren't as many photos in newspapers. It was yeah. a more difficult process. Uh, you had to make a half. You still they still do half tone prints. Yeah, but, but half tones were a lot that, harder. Yes, it was a much more difficult process to do. Um, when you deal with national news. Up until the 1930s, with the first wire photo, there wasn't really a way to transmit photos around. I mean, mm-hmm. if you took a photo and watched, you know, if, if the president gets shot or whatever, and you, you can't get that photo to the other side of the country, you know, inside of two or three days. Yeah, you have to physically transport yeah. the yeah. the first wire fo- the first wire photos. It was around the 30s too, and that when the first wire photos came out, which mm-hmm. is another another really cool story and photography of the Associated Press um, that they, they had designed a machine where they could take a four by five piece of film in which most of your photojournalists use speed graphics and shot four by five anyway mm-hmm. and they could put it on a drum and there was like a little tiny light that would blink on and off and a little tiny sensor so it would spin around in this drum and then the light would blink on and off and the sensor would see either see darker light and it would that would create and it would create a signal yep. that made dots. Well, they would what they would do is they would have these machines set up through a telephone line, and then on the other end there would be a piece of blank film, and that little when it would receive the signal on or off, it would flash a little tiny little like a little tiny light on or off, and expose or or not expose a little where a little dot was, and then they would get that image transmitted through the phone line. Mm-hmm. And these machines cost like it's, it's, the cool thing about the story is the machines they cost like a, I don't know it was like a two hundred fifty thousand three hundred thousand dollar machine, Jeez. which which at that time frame we were talking like a couple million dollars. Yeah. So they picked like six newspapers they wanted to do it at, and um, the guy that was the CEO of the Associated Press was the one who was vehemently against the whole thing. He said it would bankrupt them. And that he would he would quit. He said that people only cared about reading that photography was just supplemental. Oh God! <laughs> and, and and so on and so forth. And uh, and he he sold all of his stock and quit the board. That was and, a uh, wrong choice. And the, it was a very wrong choice. And they went free with it. Um, the first day they set it up, uh, the Denver Nugget, which is like a paper that's now defunct, day and age. Um. Oh, yeah. There was like a politician that like he was flying a plane with his family and he crashed into the side of a mountain. So a guy drove up and took a picture from the side of the road of the plane wreckage and then drove back to the paper. And that was like the first image that was transmitted over the wire. Oh, that's cool. And well, then terrible, like a, cool. it was like a few days later, uh, Charles Lindbergh's baby was kidnapped from his house. And then they transmitted a picture of the ladder up to the window where some guy had like climbed in and stole the baby. And that became like one of the first massive, overly sensationalized news stories, where photos were being transmitted and writing that story for you know the next several weeks. Yeah, and um, that's pretty much what secured wire photography. Yeah, that would and do it. It just it just evolved yeah, from there. So it's news has been so, sensationalized for as long as we've had news. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, oh, ha- it has. But that's um, that's one of the big changing things there. I don't know. It's it's hard for me to like not actually plan to talk about. That no, that's sort of fine. Thing. I think that that's a pretty good coverage of the beginning of, yeah. of news and or a big, the beginning of photography and photojournalism. Yeah. Really, a lot of and it you... was just that it was something that just had not happened yeah. before, and it's something that I think that the problem is is that none of us can imagine a life without it. Like, yeah, we just have always well, the... had it. 
Yeah, the, the well, FSA. The, the F, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I think it's incredibly interesting kind of the way photojournalism is evolving now that everyone has a camera on them. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I think about the, the protests still going on in Hong Kong. Yeah. You know, you think about what happened in the Tiananmen Square massacre. There's one we've photo. Yeah. Or like we've got one famous photo of that. And yeah. now well, we have. We a have lot. We have a lot of yeah, and I know there, there are a lot more one, photos. Yeah. Um, Tank Man. Yeah. We have um, one yeah. that people know. Now we just have, you know, so much video from what's going on in Hong Kong, you couldn't possibly sit down and consume it all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's uh, and there, there's actually a good bit of news footage from the Tiananmen protest at that time, too. Um, the photography that got out was not, not as much, and it's still like... Uh, you know, it's an interesting story because I, I have a friend that's in China, and he told me that, uh, you know, his wife didn't know anything about Tiananmen. Mm -hmm. And um, she didn't even believe him until they came back to visit his family here, and they sat down on the Internet and looked it up. Yeah. And he showed her all the pictures and the, th the footage and everything, and, and she, she had had no clue that it had ever even happened. Yeah, that's um, still the case for a lot of, yeah. Yeah. And uh, just here recently, just about, uh, just a few months ago, um, Leica was doing a series of ads. Which is interesting because the, the Tiananmen tank guy picture was actually taken with a Nikon camera. Uh -huh. but I Leica remember did, hearing about that. Leica yeah, kind well, of took, tried to take credit for that photo, and they are like, no, 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 yeah. that was taken with an icon. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't, I don't think they really took credit for the photo. They, they, they were making... I, I, they were making commercials talking about how important they've been and that company has been for the history of photojournalism. So there's like a there's like a little a little uh, like a little uh, I guess like a little skip commercial where yeah, the photographer is taking like the picture out the window of the hotel and then the Chinese military come in and he has to like hide the film and stuff like that. And and China was. The Chinese government was in huge uproar over it. Yeah, uh, had had all like was banning Leica products in China and stuff like that, and they pulled the commercial and blah blah blah. Yeah, but uh, which they were they were an important part of photojournalism. That that picture just wasn't taken with one. Yeah. yeah. Um. You know, I guess I guess uh, I guess if I was going to talk about photojournalism, I talk about Ancarte Brasson a lot. You know, he's mm -hmm. considered the 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 father of modern photojournalism, uh, World War II, uh, and he was strictly a Leica user, a uh, French photographer. You know, he was there during the German occupation. Ever followed his work? He traveled all over the world and did a lot of neat things. Yeah, we should explain that uh, um, Leica cameras nowadays are just seen as these heinously expensive, uh, kind of highfalutin cameras. Yeah, but for a they long kind time, of always were. Well, they, they kind of always were, but but for a long time they were small, good, reliable, tanky little cameras. Um, they still are. Well, I know yeah, they, they still, still are, are but they're now still, they're just they're still good. now there's other camera companies that can do that stuff. Well, it, what? It, yeah, I mean that's that's back into gear. Um, yeah. But no, no, no. But that, I, I just wanted to explain why we kept saying this one name over yeah. and over again. Um, oh yeah. Well, the the Japanese camera companies. Uh, the Canon, Canon started out when Canon came out in Japan. They were making copies of Leicas. Yeah, the LTM thirty nine. Yeah, their their first cameras were were thirty nine millimeter thread mount cameras that were direct copies of Leicas. Mm -hmm. um, when Nikon started out, their first cameras were direct copies of Contax, which is another expensive mm -hmm. German brand from the era. Um, did not they more recently went out of business than. Mm -hmm. They finally folded. Leica struggled the past several years too, but uh, it, it, they came out and they were cheap. Yep, um, they were they were made, you know, they were made by people that didn't. That there was a good quality stuff that was a lot less expensive, and that's what made them get a a stronghold and why they still do. But um, so we kind of covered the beginnings of photojournalism, and I think there are some really good videos out there if people are super interested in that. But oh yeah, um, yeah, Google. I think uh, one thing that you could give us some insight on is if a student let's say at asu wants to get into doing that 
what would be their first steps or what would be the advice that you'd give them? And wants to get in, be a photojournalist? Yes. And that advice cannot be go back in time 40 years to when it was relevant. No, no, it's still relevant. <laughs> I it's know. still very relevant. Um, <laughs> um, be a photojournalist specifically. Uh, have a passion for journalism. So you have think a that's a better place to start? Storytelling. Uh, you know, be be willing to look into a career that involves, you, you know, odd hours. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, gosh, you know, it's that. I think mean, that's the main, that's the main thing. It's just is develop a passion for storytelling, yeah. a passion for photography, a passion for uh, visual storytelling. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, as good as all these guys I'm talking about, like Henri Cartier-Bresson, you've got to know. If you don't, if you don't know his life story and who he is, it's uh, that's pretty critical to understand somebody and how he he came about. He was actually a, yeah, you know, he wanted to be a painter. He, yeah, he never wanted to be a photographer. He was he used to hang out with Matisse and Picasso and stuff like that. Yeah, and I think the and, narrative um, thing is important because I think a lot of the images we see online are just cool looking or pretty places um, and don't really have that narrative component, especially yeah. Depends uh, on where you go online. between photographs. Yeah, of course it does. But the really popular well, stuff, you, the stuff that most if you're, people it, see. You're talking about like, well, you mentioned earlier how things like everybody having cell phones has changed photojournalism. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it, it's easy if you spend a lot of time on Facebook or Instagram or something like that to ponder that. Mm -hmm. But if you, um, if you go somewhere like uh, go, go go look at go look at Magnum's website or go go to uh, go to the Boston Globe, which is the news Boston's newspaper. Yeah, and you go to uh, what is it they call it? They're uh, the big picture, I think. Yeah, go go to the Boston Globe big picture, and you look at the pictures there, and you're gonna say, oh no, these cell phone people don't mean shit. Yeah, <laughs> they're not the ones on the front lines. Yeah. Um, they're the they're the people standing by snapping but they're not the ones telling us the stories they're not the ones going out there and bringing back uh, it, it and I, I mean a good photographer can take a take an iphone and take good pictures you know oh yeah yeah that's, yeah i would not ever that's sure and, and i can camera. take i can take somebody that doesn't know how to that doesn't know how to visually illustrate things and give them a hundred thousand dollars worth like us and you know they're not going to come back with it yeah but uh it, it, the cell phone stuff it just you know, I think probably when the first, when the first, you know, when the first Polaroids came out, and when the, back when the first brownie cameras with the roll film they had to send back to Kodak to get printed came mm -hmm. out, uh, people probably said the same thing. Yeah. Oh, this is going to wreck our whatever, but it, it's it didn't, and it, it's still it's really not. I mean, it's uh, it, 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 you, you go and you look at that, you go and you look at the real deal stuff. And, and, and all of a sudden, the cell phone stuff becomes very mediocre. Yeah. Um, I think it's changed some things. Like, I see a lot of, like, uh, and, and, you know, so, sometimes at work, you know, at the university, I'll, you know, I'll see, I see a lot of things go through our social media that come from mediocre mm -hmm. sources. <laughs> and I think it yeah. tends to make, it tends to make things just sort of blend into the mix. Yeah. Um, it's when you get those really visually interesting photos. Um, sometimes I'll say those sharp, clear photos, but you know, photojournalism doesn't necessarily have to be those sharp, clear, technically perfect photos. Yeah. I think, I think that's something some people can get a little too obsessed with as they get into photography, not as they move past the cell phone. Is is a little t perfection isn't always. I think one of the things. Um, I, in my suggestions I gave you was comparing Robert Frank mm -hmm. and Walker Evans and uh, the big jump. That was one of the big evolutions in photojournalism right there. Um, Robert Frank immigrated to America. You know, I, I don't know where he was from. He was from, uh, I don't know if he was like French or German or Swiss or something. He came from Europe. But he came over here in the 50s and um, he kind of set out to do what Walker Evans had done. Because Walker Evans' body of work is like, of all the farm security photographers, Walker Evans 
you, you were more familiar with Dorothy Elaine's just one photo or um, mm-hmm. uh, Gordon Parks' American Gothic, which is an amazing photo as well with an amazing story behind it. Mm-hmm. Um, but Walker Evans really traveled the country and covered everything. And it's this huge and amazing body of work. And he was sort of a perfectionist. Um, you could tell he was a little bit more of one to set up pictures. Yeah, um, definitely. Shoot a larger format film. Um, Frank was one to not worry about whether or not things were blurry or in focus. He was one to shoot 35 millimeter and uh, not and worry more about the storytelling aspect of it than the actual photo quality. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the things I think that actually, even though cameras got better and things, you look at you look at photojournalism, it really came to where it's more about the picture than the technical perfection. You know, photographers like Ansel Adams, um, these guys were all about technical perfection and they went off into one area and the, the news photography went off into another in that aspect. And that's mm-hmm. that's an interesting an interesting thing to compare and contrast in in photography. But uh, Robert Frank, um, he published a book called The Americans. Mm-hmm. And that's probably, to this date, that's probably, if, if I had to pick like, the most single important book of photography ever created, I would probably say Robert Frank's The Americans. Is it The Americans or is it American Photographs? The Americans. Okay. I hope. (laughs) (laughs) I'm pretty sure, yeah. No, The Americans, it was like like 1950, like mid-50s, something like that. Um, Gosh. Uh, I, I just looked it up for you. It's a 1958 and it is, oh, the Amer- yeah. it is the American. Yes, there it is. Okay. Yeah. Oh, cool. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I was just starting to worry about. I don't know. Gosh, you know, I'm one to like not remember correctly. Oh, no. That's fine. Um, yeah, I think yeah, that, that would be a really yeah, good. Yeah, I was thinking probably a little before 58. But Walker Evans actually, he came to do that book. He came to, to work on that series because he was an admirer of Evans. And I guess Evans secured him. I don't know the whole story about it, but um, Walker Evans actually secured him a grant to go and do it. Oh, that's cool. But, um, Oh yeah, the incredible stuff. Um, yeah, see, Henri Cartier-Bresson, Robert Frank. Gosh, there's been so many, you know, important photojournalists since then. Oh yeah, and that's that's pretty easy to find. I, I really yeah. was interested in what you were, what what you thought was the the thing, um, and we've got that. Um, yeah, I think yeah, street that... photography. Street photography is another. Oh yeah, street photography is a whole bag. We're not getting into. Uh... We're not going to get into Yeah. It. Well, that's kind of evolved out of yeah. photo journal. Yeah. It's a different, a little bit different. Um, it's become very popular these yes. past few years, even though it's golden age kind of died out in the 60s. Yeah, for for anyone interested in street it. photography, just as a passing note, tell them to go look up uh, Sean Tucker on YouTube. Okay. Sean okay. Tucker on YouTube. Go look at that, guys. Um, yeah. How does he spell Sean? Um, S E A N. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, so we're actually getting close to the end here. We've we've burnt a lot of time. There's a few things we're gonna skip, um, but I think that an important thing is, and I want a little bit of this from both of you, uh, is I have a student who's taken. Let, let's just say I have a hypothetical student who's taken some pictures on their iPhone, they take some selfies, they take pictures of things in their life. How does that student get started? And how do they get better moving towards what the three of us would consider photography from just taking pictures? Uh, Steven, you want to go first on that one? Yeah, sure. Um, I would say if you can afford it, find a camera, any camera that you can change lenses on. Mm -hmm. And just start experimenting yeah and i would Um, say that nowadays you can get an old like sony mirrorless body for about 100 bucks on ebay and get one of those yeah they're cheap and easy and if you break them you won't be sad yeah you can get used equipment cheap um uh anything made in the last you know eight five eight years is gonna probably be more camera than you are photographer yes (laughs) Um, and I've I've been in that. I don't mean to be insulting, but I've been in that situation many times myself. Where I've got a, you know, camera that far can do a lot more than I can do with it. Yeah. Um, and just keep practicing, keep learning, 
um, you know, as long as it's interesting to you, keep doing it. And eventually you'll learn more and more, get better and better. Yeah. David, yeah. you got anything for getting started or um, getting better? Same. Same thing. Uh, get some basic equipment. Don't worry too much about gear acquisition. Get a, uh, a basic camera and a basic lens. And before you start worrying about trying to get more equipment, learn how to use it. Learn how to use it, first of all. Um, learn, learn, learn how exposure works. Learn, know all your f-stops and your shutter speeds, your reciprocals, and understand all all the mechanical stuff early on. I think, uh, I think when I started, you know, there wasn't any such thing as a digital camera, and we weren't allowed to have a a camera. We had to use manual cameras in school, mm-hmm. and we had to. When not only that, we also had to write down. We had to record our settings as we shot, and then we had to turn in contact sheets. You couldn't just print one or two frames. You had to turn in a whole sheet, and mm-hmm. uh, that way your instructor saw every time you pushed a button. Um, and I think that forced us to learn that mechanical stuff. But I think if you learn it early on, it's going to benefit you. If you can't, it, it you should be able to pick up. You should be able to pick up a camera. Um. You should be able to pick up a camera with nothing but a light meter and a roll of film and function with it the same way you can with any digital camera Yeah. in any situation. you should, If you know how to use it, um, and once you've got that knowledge, you kind of forget it. You do, it's sort of like, it's like, you know, when you learn to drive a car with a stick shift, you know, you, you, you have to sit there and carefully release the clutch and shift. But after a while, it's just kind of, it's like tying your shoes. You know, you don't, when you're a little kid, there was like a little rhyme, lefty over righty or whatever, you know. Once you get past age eight, you know, you just do it. Yeah. Um, so yeah. you learn to use the camera first and then you develop a passion for making images. You know, mm-hmm. you you get out, you find guys like me and Steven. Um, th- th- I've never had a situation where a student came up to me and asked me questions where I didn't want to talk to them. And it may happen when I'm too busy. Yeah. But there's never been a situation where if I thought they were genuinely interested, I wasn't there to help. And when I was young, there were a lot of old guys that were there to help me. Yeah, and, that's, and one that's thing super that's important like, is one... finding people in your community that can help because yeah. photography, like a lot of the edge hobbies in life, is one of those things where people want to talk about it, as you can tell from oh, yeah. this conversation. Uh, yeah, and, I, I yeah, am not thing. the most talkative person in the world, but if you start talking to me about photography, I will keep going and going. Yeah, and I probably talk finally... too much. <laughs> <laughs> we all do. Steve, Steven said, he kind of touched into this when he was earlier on in our, our conversation here, much earlier on. Steven touched into this, and he was saying something. I don't remember exactly how you worded it, but you were talking about uh, – how you can go out on your social media and see the work of other photographers and that's helped you grow and improve. Well, I, the neatest thing about this profession, mm-hmm. um, the people in it, I mean, and even the freelance people, I mean, you'll find people that uh, that want to keep their secrets guarded or, or whatever, but those are kind of rare. And, you know, I mean, the yeah. most of the people are incredibly cool. Well, And, and they're they're there are people that will look at you if you're their direct competition and tell you how they did something. They'll make sure you learn it. Well, that's the interesting thing with, with photography. And I feel like it's a little bit kind of like auto racing or motor racing of any kind of where people get so excited about how they got it done that that's what they want to share. Like the results are almost secondary to the process. Yeah. If I learned a new technique or new way of taking a photo, I can't wait to tell somebody about it. Yeah. Yeah. Just... Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. And it's people. It's so you get out. You get it's people that are in photography. It's there's it's it, you know like it's like I have a professional organization I'm in. It's for university photographers, and and I got into that probably a year after I started at ASU, and it's this really neat group because there's all these different people at all these different places, but there's you you find it's a group of people you have more in common with. Yeah. I, I think everybody, it, it, to a certain degree, everyone who succeeds in photography is probably has a little bit of ADD. Yeah. If not a lot. Um, <laughs> some of us are like crazy with it. And uh, 
and it's one of the things I think that, that makes you good at the job because you're always doing things differently and you kind of go from thing to thing. And, um, and we, we, there's just like a certain, uh, there's like a certain quirk, everyone who's successful in photography or everyone who's good at it. There's like a certain quirk they have that nobody else has. Mm-hmm. It's almost like it, 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 it I, I can sit down with somebody who's can be, um, of a completely different background, mindset, religion, you know, ethnicity, uh, gender, whatever. And I find that I almost have more in common with that person than just about everybody else. Um, yeah. I mean, skateboarding is a similar thing. Um, yeah, I think any well, just like really serious hobby kind of has that sort of, or not hobby, but any skill or technical acquisition whatever you want to call it see i don't know i don't think so i don't think so no i think i think photography is more unique i think photography i think people that are in photography are are probably uh are probably more quirky than everybody else i (laughs) I don't think doctors and lawyers and mechanics and uh and maybe maybe every profession has something in a personality that drives people to do it Mm -hmm. but i think i think photography is one that that takes that to a different level I can see that. And um, and and I can connect with people like um, uh, like, like I don't I you know like uh, like Stephen here. He, we've never met. I don't I don't even know what he looks like or anything. But <laughs> I, I can tell he's probably somebody that you know if he, he could probably like shoot me an email tomorrow and say, hey, I'm going to be up in Alabama. I was like, oh, you need a place to stay. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, we're mm-hmm. we're gonna we're we're gonna get along. You know, yeah. I mean, I'm gonna mm-hmm. I've got this guy's back. Um, yeah, you want to come shoot at the coast? Come stay down here. After, after, yeah. after the virus is over. After, yeah, yeah after. Well, go gra- grab your kayak and meet me halfway, and we'll go paddle, yeah. paddle the uh, cheesy pond. I'll send you some pictures of it. It's pretty freaking amazing. Yeah, I think that's a really um, good point, that it, it is something that brings people together in a lot of ways. Yeah. And it's interesting, because if you find somebody who knows more than you, you immediately drill them for everything they know. And if oh, you yeah. find somebody who knows less yeah. than you, then you just start explaining um yeah and i think and, and, let's end on one important question or steven did you have something i was just gonna say that uh, it reminded me what he was saying about a um a photo workshop i went to in yellowstone mm-hmm. i didn't know anybody there but we all got along great <laughs> yeah yep yeah. You going yeah. um okay so what i want to end this on is either um where do you get your inspiration or who or what should we be paying attention to if we're starting out in photography or trying to get into it or just interested? Whichever one of those questions you want, it's yours. Um, I, I guess I can take this. Yeah, um, go for it. I'll just tell people where I pay attention. Yeah. And that is um, YouTube. Um, I've learned quite a lot of what I know from YouTube and um other social media forms, but um, people, um, two particular YouTubers, uh, Thomas Heaton, uh, he's a landscape photographer in the UK, mm-hmm. and he talks a lot about just his whole process, you know, going out camping, and he might show you two images on a 20 minute video, because mm-hmm. for him, it's just all about the process. Mm hmm the experience of going outdoors and taking an image Mm -hmm. and then um the other one is uh the art of photography uh which oh yeah uh, i like that youtube yeah ted forbes um if you want to understand more about the history of photography and um, yeah what what was the first one you said uh thomas heaton h-e-a-t-o-n yes okay cool thank you Cool. Um, yeah, I'm going to Google. Uh, and I'm David, who should notes. we pay? Who should we be paying attention to, or where do you get your inspiration? Um, um I think uh, it, when we're talking to a student here that's first starting out in photography, um, yeah, I, I, go with uh, maybe not specific individuals, but there there is a ton of stuff on YouTube now, and it's hard for me to recommend because I don't really get out on it as much as I would like to. Um. It's hard for me to recommend any one certain person, and I've seen so many that have bad information. Mm-hmm. Um, so where do you get your inspiration uh, to shoot, though? Because you shoot um, a lot. Um, I like to record life. 
I like to record what I see. Mm-hmm. I, I think I, everyone's a little different. It depends on the person I'm talking to. I might say, uh, I might, I might say, try and read Susan Sontag's autobiography, mm-hmm. which is a collection of essays by yes. a, a New York art person that kind of um, it easy it easily goes over the head. It, it's it's a lot of uh, technical reading. Um, I would say that's a really good book to to look into right there. Um, yeah, I would definitely not try to read that it. cover to cover in one sitting. You'll die. No. Yeah. I, I, um, I would say uh, develop a passion. Develop a passion for making pictures, and, or it just it, either find whether or not you have it. If you don't have it, you're not gonna you're not gonna you're gonna get bored with it before long. Yeah. Uh, and then you have to find out what kind of what really gets to you. I mean, I do a lot of different. See, I like a lot of different stuff. I like landscape photography. I. Uh, uh-huh. Yeah, that's why I have the four by five camera and the black and white film, and I, I know the zone system and all that, and and I like photojournalism. Uh-huh. I, I, I like both. Uh, photojournalism probably drives me a little more. Uh-huh. Um, when you see into when you see stories on the news, go go out and look, look at the pictures. Yeah, I think that's um, a good point. Uh, look, look, pick up magazines. Look through. Uh, Go, go to the Boston Globe's big picture. I mean, you can go go to that site and look at those photo galleries they put on there, and it's stuff from all over the world, and it's amazing stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and and some pictures of it's amazing stories. I mean, I think I think um, as much as having passion for making the pictures, you have to have a passion for people, yeah, and people's stories and just life in general. Um, you 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 know, I go places like uh, sometimes I'll get like I'll go. I'll take my kayak and paddle it out on the Alabama River and watch the sunrise in the morning, and um, it's the most beautiful thing you can see. And just you know, having a passion for that kind of visual imagery mm-hmm. in everything you do—I mean, that's um, that—that's where I find inspiration. Uh, awesome. As far as certain people goes, I don't know. No, that's um, fine. That's totally okay. I think that... I, I, no, no, I, there are. Um, I, I guess here locally, you know, there's a guy here like Mickey Wells here locally who I think is just an incredible photographer. Mm-hmm. And every time he shows up at ASU, I know I'm going to go to the Montgomery Advertiser's website and see what he got because <laughs> I want to compare what he did to what I did. Uh-huh. Um, it, it's interesting. It's, sometimes it's very interesting if you are on assignment somewhere and they're a photographer and then you compare what, what that person shot to what you shot. Mm-hmm. And you see a different person's way of looking at the world. Yeah. Um, in photojournalism, that's that's pretty big. Um, well, and I think that there's... even even not an assignment, but there's even times where you're going out and photographing for fun, and it's so interesting to see what you take versus what somebody else took when you're on yeah. the same oh, hike or on sure. the same boat. Even um, yeah, I enjoyed doing that with you that day. We yep. went to the big yeah. mud hole. Over. Yeah, this um, is really interesting. Um. Yeah, yeah, all the time, uh, and I've got a lot of friends on Facebook. You yeah. know, I look at I look at what they I, I've tons of people on there. I can sit there and look through their pictures all day, and, and some of them are really good. Well, and I think that's um, an important thing is that when you're using social media, you do need to be critical and looking at people who are producing quality work, not just work that you like. Whatever object is in the photograph. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, and you look at the master, the masters of the art, um, mm-hmm. you, you look at, you read the stories about Gordon Parks. Um, you, you look at Walker Evans, you look at Robert Frank, you look at, um, uh, Henri Cartier-Bresson, uh, Sebastian Salgado is a mm-hmm. photographer. Um, I've actually got, that. uh, Salgado's, uh, one of his books. Um, yeah, nice. Just yeah. Gorgeous to just thumb through. Yeah, yeah, and that yeah, was a big also, white guy there. Um, photography there's... books really are not that expensive anymore. Um, some of them some are. Don't are. get me wrong. Some of them aren't crazy expensive, but um, yeah, they're really not expensive. that bad. And seeing those photographs printed on these larger format photography books is really just stunning. I mean, it's it's the experience versus seeing something on a screen is just different. Oh yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Everything kind of blends together on the yeah. screen. Um, we, we didn't even talk about the difference between screen and print, and we don't have the time. Um, yeah, and so actually, speaking of Salgado, real quick, though, oh yeah, if go. you have Netflix, um, look for uh, the Salt of the Earth, which is a documentary about him. Okay, oh, I was not um, aware that was there. Another, was another name to another name you can't not mention 
if we're going to talk about photojournalism, was probably James Knockway. Mm-hmm. He's still working and probably the most most well known, uh, still working photographer in our time. Mm-hmm. Um, amazing, incredible. Google. He's got a TED talk. Uh, there was a documentary oh, made about cool. him too. It was called War Photographer. It was made during the Balkan. Most okay. of it was filmed during the Balkans when he was shooting there. If you're a, if you're in photojournalism, you, you have to see the movie War Photographer because it will, uh, it'll challenge all of your concepts about uh, the mission of photojournalism yeah. and the ethics within it, and uh, it, it it plays into all that more than anything. And Nakwe is somebody who's made it his entire life. Yeah, and he's had no other life besides that. He's yeah. had like all kinds of. He's had bullets go through his hair, and he's had all kinds of diseases. Oh God! And, and and done all kinds of things, but he's dedicated his his from Vietnam on. He's dedicated his life to it, and it's uh once again incredible work. Um, yeah, yeah. I would list. I would list off uh, for somebody starting. I, I, yeah, I think... for someone starting out, I would say go back to you know learn the mechanical stuff, make your connections, learn the works of all these masters, have passion for it. Um. We can list all this stuff out, and you can you can put links in your comments or something. I yeah, guess. I'll put some of the basic stuff, but I really do want people to kind of just do the googling on what they're interested in. Mm-hmm. But I think that's a that's probably a good note to uh, to end this thing on. Uh, we've definitely burnt time here. Um, but yeah, thank you so much to both of you for joining me today. I, I assume that we could talk about this for another hundred hours and not run out of oh, stuff sure. to talk about. Yeah, well, um, cut out half of what I said so I don't sound like an idiot. Nope. You can get to keep all of it. Uh, but yeah, uh, thank you so much to both of you. Uh, it's been great, and this will be a good resource going into the future. Uh, thank you both.